Welcome back to episode 177 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here, Troy. Hey, Troy, what's up? Not a whole lot. You were a lot more busy than I have been lately. Yeah, busy day. Just got back from the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers, row the boat, Sky Uma. My son is a senior in high school, plans to attend the University of Minnesota next fall. And he's going to do something a little bit different. Well, not for a lot of people, but I don't really come from a military family. My grandfather's, I think, served in World War II, but I never really knew them. So what Sam wants to do is go to the Army ROTC, no. which is basically it's a leadership program where when you're done, you can either go into the National Guard or reserves or active duty, and you are commissioned, I guess, as an officer. All this stuff is brand new. We know nothing about this. So we go to the U, and it's at the Armory, which I learned today, Troy, is the second oldest building at the University of Minnesota, built in like 1890-something. It's like a castle. I mean, it's kind of like an armory, but like a castle that was mm-hmm. built in, well, in the 1800s. And it's got this huge tower, like very tall tower. And we get there, and there's a bunch of students in army uniforms repelling off the tower, like over and over again. And <laughs> maybe my wife just I would, like, I would oh. went home. I'd just You're like, like I'm I, told, I told my <laughs> wife, I'm like, this is where my military career would end. <laughs> so then we get up there and they kind of greet you and they point to the people. Rep- and some people are going like backwards, like, you know, like where you put your feet off the building and jump. Yeah. Other people are just like diving headfirst down it and then like diving and then slowing down at the end before you hit the ground. And the guy, the guy looks at Sam. He's like, do you want to do it? And Sam was like, uh, yeah. And me and Jenny, my wife, we were like fainted, right? This, uh, it, they ran out of time. So thank God he didn't end up doing that. But so it was, it was kind of a, it was an interesting experience. But here's though, where and I can't believe that my son doesn't want to do this. So in the same armory, it's one of the bigger ones in the nation. They have the army ROTC and then they have Navy. Air Force, Marines, and Troy, Space Force, oh, yeah. ROTC. That's a new branch. It's a new branch of our government. If I had to go into the military, I would be like 100% in Space Force. <laughs> what do you even TV? do in Space Force? Oh, there's a TV show on Netflix, right? Like, Well, that was the Steve Carell thing, right? <laughs> it was uh, Seth MacFarlane, right? Seth MacFarlane, yeah. And uh, now Space Force, I guess you got to protect the satellites and... You like shoot like know, lasers it? and like like fight battles on Mars or something. Like, what do you? I don't know. I'm watching Three Body Problem right now on Netflix. So, holy cow, good show. Is that good? That, highly recommended. That's the Game of Thrones guys. Yeah, highly recommended. Game of Thrones, or is it Game of Thrones? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it I, I just listened to Bill Simmons had them on his podcast, and yeah, they made that show during COVID. But that's fantastic. A very very interesting day. Just got back. Now, kind of putting my frame of mind back in hockey cards. Uh, almost the end of the season. We'll be talking about that in the upcoming shows. But we were just start mentioning a little bit before we started recording. Holy cow. What individual performances we have this year. Mm-hmm. And you got to watch a little. You got to watch Nathan McKinnon just smoke our smoke team. Wild yesterday, yeah. It seemed like I saw like three highlights and it's like we our skates were cemented to the ice and he was just skating around us like oh, we he was basically traffic cones out there so fast. And I think they mentioned it on the broadcast, but I think he is this is where that NHL edge comes into play. That website where you can look at all the fun, how fast they skate. I think he's got the highest number of burst of 22 miles per hour or more. This season, I'm actually looking at it right now to see if I can find the game yesterday because there was one he just took. I was the first goal I think he scored. He just took off. <laughs> like everyone just yeah. kind of like looked like they're stuck in mud as he goes skating by him. Who's our goalie last night? Ours was uh, Gustafson. Oh, okay. Is 22 miles an hour about top speed for? I don't know. Yeah, I think. So. I mean, I'm sure that I, I don't know. I was trying to find the record, but this site is so. Well, McKinnon's hit his all-time high this year was 24. Wow. 
And let's put him in the 99th percentile. So yeah, 24 is probably the top. That's moving. Oh, here it is. So this is for this year. Speed burst over 20. 696 times. He's went over wow. 20 an hour. Yeah, or, just crazy. I don't, I don't know. Bog us down. We can, I could spend some time looking at this. How bad did our team look? We're just... We're just we, we never look good. We never look bad. We just muddle around and lose games. Mm-hmm. We have one good player. <laughs> yep. Well, Brock Faber, two good players. And then I have I, Jewel Erickson Eck just got high sticked right in the face. The ref's like, nope, not a penalty. <laughs> really? Uh, it was just, it was bad overall. Well, we better stop because either yeah. we're going to bore people with 17 hours of wild wine line <laughs> wine line yeah or i'll just get depressed and won't be able to continue the show because it was yeah it's uh uh not a lot to look forward to at this point for our minnesota wild uh maybe next year yeah oh, maybe next year all right before we get started though just a reminder that our show troy the hockey cards gong show podcast is a patreon podcast which well means we rely on support from listeners and watchers to help us cover our show expenses, produce more and hopefully better hockey card content, and fun initiatives, even in a small way to grow the hockey card hobby. You can support us through Patreon, be one of our first 199 supporters, join our on a 199 support level tier. It's very easy to do. It starts at $5 a month. You can just go to our website, hockeycardsgonkshow.com, click on the Become a Patron link, go to the Patreon website directly. That's at P-A-T. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I've spelt that literally 14,000 times. <laughs> I was like, you spelt that a number of times, but that's something I would do. It's like like this morning, hard. like my work computer, I forgot my password for five seconds. I'm like, how many times have I logged into this thing? And I forget it now, but then I remember it. Oh. Well, if you can't spell Patreon like me and you just <laughs> want to go to the show description, if you're listening to us on a podcast app or watching us on YouTube, the link to our Patreon is there as well. And then finally, it's in our TikTok and Instagram profile. All right, Troy. You ready with the game plan, buddy? We begin the show with the almost greatest player to wear, number 77. Then we throw a little wrinkle into the deep dive series and do our first segment of a deep dive on a specific set. Exciting. Then it's off to Hobby News, followed by our Spring Expo preview in Toronto with Mikey Singer. We have a good interview coming up with him. Next is new product releases. We end the show with looking at some of our favorite hockey cards in the upcoming PWCC weekly auction and then any personal pickups, which we are going to rename to just Josh's personal pickups because I'm, I don't know, a month with nothing. War chest. Get you a hockey fail stickers. Yeah, hockey fail. Definitely. Okay, here we go. Josh, previously we looked at the greatest NHL player that wore the number that matched our episode number. We ran through all the numbers, so now we are looking at the almost greatest NHL player to wear each number from the runners-up in the Hockey Writers' Greatest NHL Player to Wear Each Number article. I'm chuckling to myself because I'm remembering a comment I saw that someone put, I can't even, you just wrote who, and they said it was something about how we talk about all our boyfriends. Yeah. (laughs) And I just started cracking up thinking about that. So anyways, I... I go read the YouTube comments, I guess, in the last Apparently, show. we have so many boyfriends. So. <laughs> I just, I don't know why that popped into my head. But, all right, Josh, the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 77. Yep. Almost greatest NHL player to wear number 77. Per the nominees in the Hockey Writers Greatest NHL Player to each Number article and selected by me, it's this guy right here, Josh, Paul Coffey. Heard of him. Heard of him. All-time great. Can't even get the greatest to wear number 77. He's the runner-up. There were two additional pretty good names in the runners up list at number 77. So I'm going to give a little, I'm going to say who they are, and then I'm going to a little spiel. Phil Esposito and Victor Hedman. As a reminder, yep. greatest to wear number 77 was Ray Bork. So you can now see why Coffee probably lost out a little bit. Now, before we learn about Paul Coffee, it should be noted that from a career perspective, Phil Esposito, I don't know, he, he, he would probably be my pick if I was just comparing the three runners up at number 77 without considering the number they wore. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah just looking okay. at the totality of their career. Yes, because the only thing is Esposito wore number 77 for five seasons with the Rangers at the end of his career. 
Mm-hmm. Coffee wore number 77 for 13 seasons after he originally wore number seven with the Oilers. So I chose Paul Coffee and could have easily done Esposito. But I feel we've talked about, I think we've talked about Esposito a little more just from hockey card preview section. Section. I'm not sure how long, how often we've talked about coffee. I didn't look, but I yeah. figured I'm going with Paul Coffee. So let's learn about Paul Coffee, Josh. Can I say he something may, before we yeah, start? Go ahead. Go for it. And I, I don't know if you're going to get into this. You might. I kind of feel like or I've out. How should I say this? In the past couple of years, I feel like this guy doesn't get. Like there's always when everyone talks about everything, like all his stats, all his accomplishments, it's always an asterisk. Like nobody really considers him that great. But and I've never really understood why. So I'm hoping to learn that well, through this conversation. I don't get into it, but there was always a knock on him that he just wasn't the greatest pure defenseman, like a defensive defenseman. Maybe that's part of it. I don't get into that. Okay. I, I don't have enough room for that. But do you know what I mean though? It's like yeah. nobody like when you talk about the greatest defenseman of all time. It's like, I don't feel like he's mentioned yeah, all that much. For, forget about him. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right, we'll go on. Defenseman from Weston, Ontario, Canada. Coffee was the sixth overall selection in the 1980 NHL entry draft by the Edmonton Oilers. Coffee played in 1,409 regular season NHL games over a 21 season NHL career. Coffee began his career playing seven seasons with the Edmonton Oilers. After his time with Edmonton, he then would go on to play for another eight NHL teams. In wow. chronological order after Edmonton, Coffee played for Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, Detroit, Hartford, Philadelphia, Chicago, Carolina, and Boston. So would that Hartford? be so would that be yeah, would that be eight NHL teams with only seven NHL franchises after Edmonton? Ooh, <laughs> Ooh sneaky. Sneaky. Anyway, do you remember yeah, seeing did. him in a Hartford jersey? I don't remember him in half of these <laughs> jerseys, yeah. like the Flyers. I don't remember. Uh, I definitely Pittsburgh. L.A. was short. I know that was a short one. Um, but anyways, awards and accomplishments. Josh Hall of Famer, four time Stanley Cup winner, three with Edmonton, one with Pittsburgh, three time Norris winner, four time NHL first All Star team selection, four time NHL second All Star team selection. 14-time NHL All-Star Game selection. Named one of the NHL's greatest players of all time or the top 100 players of all time by NHL.com in 20, what was it, 17? His number seven, which is kind of funny I put this in here because it's not 77, but his number seven Mm -hmm. was retired by Edmonton in 2005. So, again, he played for Edmonton, and then for the next 13 seasons, he wore number 77. All right, for his career. 396 goals, which is second all time for defensemen. 1,135 assists, which is, again, second all time for defensemen, but sixth all time for any player in the NHL. Career points total 1,531, which makes him, again, second all time for defensemen, 16th all time for players. Okay, but now, see, this is my point, though. Like, if you asked a Jeremy Lee type guy or really any hockey fan or collector start rattling off the top defensemen of all time. It's going to start with Bobby Orr. Then you're going to hear names like Ray Bork and then Kale McCarr. You're going to hear Nicholas Lidstrom, right? It's like, I just don't feel like the name Paul Coffey is going to be maybe not even most people's top five. And he's like got the second most points ever for a defenseman. Yeah, he's uh he's number two to Bork in all three of those. But we'll have an interesting little fact about the goal thing. Okay. All right. Coffee made the playoffs in 16 of his 21 NHL seasons, compiling 59 goals, 137 assists for 196 points in 194 NHL playoff games played. Best season. Oh, why did I do this, Josh? now I'm mad at myself. Anywho, because okay. I put him in a Pittsburgh jersey. I wanted to show him. I flip-flopped because I wanted to show him in 77. Here he is in yeah. 77. Best season of his NHL career from a point standpoint was his 85-86 season where Coffey had 48 goals, 90 assists for 138 points in 79 regular season play, regular season games played. This was with Edmonton, not Pittsburgh. Got my picture shows. But, Josh, that's pretty good. Really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> really good. 
And I was trying to think about coffee and his stats a little bit. I, I held off from some of the all-time rankings for coffee because we're going to get into those more in the fun facts. But just remember these numbers, like 48 goals. That's pretty good for a D-man. We'll see where it ranks mm-hmm. all-time when we get down there. For, well, for we, you are showing him in Pittsburgh? Yeah. That team, like that 91 championship team, is just loaded yeah. with Hall of – you got the Auger and Lemieux, of course, which most people – but then you had Paul Coffey. You had just tons and tons of – yeah. Like he was Brian on. Trottier was on that <laughs> team too, wasn't he? And that's right. Trottier sure. did go to the Penguins at one point. Was he around in '91? I think so. I think that that team was just loaded. Yeah, well, he's coffee's definitely been on some loaded Edmonton teams too. All right, Coffee was known for his speed and scoring prowess. Edmonton Oilers coach and GM Glenn Sather said that Coffee was probably the best skater he has ever seen. Pretty high praise from a guy who who Glenn Sather played with and against Bobby Orr and Guy Lafleur. So hey, Jeez. that's pretty good praise to say Coffee's the best skater you've seen. In addition, Coffee had tremendous vision, hockey sense, and a big slap shot that also contributed him to being an NHL all-time great. In Edmonton, Coffee was a huge threat as teams could try and contain forwards Gretzky, Curry, Messier, and Glenn Anderson, but then they'd have to deal with coffee who was probably one of the best offensive defense ever to play in the nhl who was i should say basically mm-hmm. like another forward out there coffee would continue to score at high levels into his mid 30s and cemented himself as one of the all-time nhl greats okay let's see if i have this picture i don't here's another picture this was supposed to be somewhere anyways paul coffee is currently in the hockey operations department of the edmonton Oilers as Special advisor to the owner and chairman. Paycheck for doing that. Sounds nothing. like a good job. Let me just maybe I'll sit outside your office, walk in, or I'll all the coffee and hang out, and we'll just talk shop. That sounds like an awesome job. Yeah. All right, we got lots of stuff to talk about. Coffee and fun and interesting. Wait, can track. I can I just oh, yeah. chime in real quick? I Go did look it. up the 91, 92 Penguins Stanley Cup yes. roster. So here's some of the names: Mario Lemieux. Heard good. of him. <laughs> Kevin Stevens. Yep, good. Joe Mullen. Yep. Larry Murphy. Yep. Mark Recchi. Yarmir Yager. Paul Coffey. Ron Francis. Oh, yeah, Francis. I forgot him. Rick Tockett. Brian Trottier. Yep. Ulf Samuelson. That's uh, pretty dang good. Pretty good. Loaded. Yeah. Loaded. Okay. All right. Fun, interesting facts. Nicknames. And Pittsburgh got the nickname of the doctor because of his surgeon-like precision as an offensive defense. And I couldn't find if he had anything like in Edmonton. Was it Coffer or some weird name off of Coffee? I don't know. But Coffee's pretty cool. You just call him Coffee. All right, here's here's a bonkers one or just kind of weird. Paul Coffee had size eight feet but wore size six. Yeah. Yeah, but he had size eight feet, but he wore size six skates as he felt the smaller skates provided a better feel and improved his control on the ice. This so blue like mindset every, had bigger skates than that. I know. Every game, he probably had to throw those off and his feet were in pain, but he, I guess he liked them better. More control. Yeah. All right. In Edmonton, Coffee's defensive partner was usually Charlie Huddy, who was a solid stay-at-home D-man, enabling Coffee to take off when the situation was right. Coffee recalled that Huddy would give him the green light to jump up into the rush. This is wild. By singing a snippet of the Men Without Hats song, The Safety Dance, which was popular at the time. Coffee said he'd sing, you can dance if you want to, and Coffee would know that Huddy was giving him permission to go and that Huddy would be covering the back end. I I wish they had mic'd up if I found video of this, but pretty That's funny. That's pretty amazing. That's wild. Okay, here's some more fun stats for, for our guy, Paul Coffee. Holds the NHL record for goals in a season by a defenseman with 48. In fact, Coffey and Bobby Orr are the only NHL defensemen to ever score 40 or more goals in a season. With Paul Coffey doing it twice and Bobby Orr only doing it once. Paul Coffey is better than Bobby Orr. <laughs> Confirmed. Yep. More 40 or more goal seasons. 
And I literally had to go. I fact checked those. And I'm like, no, I'm what? I'm like, this okay. And it was all true. But you see where I'm coming well, from, though. Like yeah. he just, for whatever reason, he doesn't get that elite, elite respect. Yeah. Holds the NHL record for career goals in the regular season and playoffs combined by a defenseman with 455 goals. So take that, Ray Borg. Mm-hmm. Tied for the most points in an NHL game by a defenseman with eight. The other defenseman with eight points in an NHL game was Tom. Is it Bladen or Bladen? I don't know. Of the Flyer, Philadelphia Flyers. B-L-A-D-O-N. Flyers fans. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me know. Never heard of them. Yeah. Holds the number two spot for most points in a season by a defenseman with 138. Coffee is one of only two defensemen to score 100 points in a season more than one time. Coffee did it five times. Bobby Orr did it six times. Mm, Bobby Orr is now better than Paul Coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's better. Coffee holds the NHL record for consecutive games with at least one point with 28. That might be by a defenseman. I think that's what by a defenseman. I, I apologize. Okay. I, I can't remember. I'll, I'll try to look it up while we're talking, but. I'm pretty sure that was a defenseman. Okay, last fun fact. Coffee held out the, at the beginning of the 1987-88 season as he wanted $800,000 instead of the $320,000 he was currently making. Oilers owner Peter Pocklington refused and then went on to say that Coffee lacked courage. <gasps> Ooh, I feel like I feel like this Peter Pock, Pocklington would take off his glove and smack you in the face and challenge you to a duel because he challenged his courage. In response, Paul Coffey said that he would never wear an Oilers jersey again and eventually was traded to Pittsburgh. So there you wow. go. Way to, way, to run, <laughs> way to run a stud defense when out of town, I guess. But, yeah, very interesting stuff. Lots of fun facts. Okay. Rookie card, Josh, 1981-82, OPG, number 111. It's on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. PSA 10 pop is 24. Gem rate is 1%. It's actually 0.97% if you really want to know. 24 pop. (laughs) 24 pop. Most recent sale of this card was $5,032.50 US via Golden on March 30th of this year. All-time high of this card was $8,500 US dollars. Via PWCC on December 15th, 2021. Seems criminally low, but that's just me. Were you a copy guy fan? I love Pog. I so I don't any kid. Chelios I, is the guy you didn't like, right? I didn't like well, Ch- yeah, I didn't like Chelios, but I as a kid growing up was just loved Edmonton. Everything was I I mean, I love the North Stars, but Gretzky, obviously. And I've yeah. told the story before on the show where I got to go to like an NHL or to a playoff game where the North Stars played the Oilers. I can't remember what year, but it was like, I literally, I think I had the chicken pox when I went. So, <laughs> but it was just coming off having the chicken pox, but it was, uh, that was the year of the great chicken pox pandemic here in yeah. uh, Minnesota. Wasn't it weird? You want to hear a fun fact? I've had chicken pox three times. Now everyone's going to say, no, you kid. can't, you can only have it once. And then you know, I've had it three times. <laughs> You're just such an overachiever, Troy. I know. Like, he I probably know set the going. record for most times of the chicken pox. Yep. There we go. That'd be on the back of your hockey card. <laughs> all right i i like this card it's a cool card yeah it's oh, awesome card. top 24 that's mind-boggling all right back to hobby deep dive you mentioned it's wrinkle Ooh. time Ooh. we're throwing in a wrinkle the zig we zig troy yep we've done rookies we've done vets and now we're gonna do sets it's kind of like a dr seuss book right there right we've well, done I like rookies, that you we've kept... done sets and now we're gonna do or vets now we're gonna do sets you kept me in here. I'm still diving, still looking at cards under the yep. ocean. I got my name tag and everything. I just added the sets edition. <laughs> That's called mailing it in, Troy. Mailing it in. I thought it'd be fun to give listeners of the show some options of sets that would be fun to learn more about and see what they pick. So we put up an Instagram poll the other day. We gave four different set options. Here, Here's the choices. 1998. OPG Blast from the Past, 2021 Allure 16 bit, the 2008 Jambalaya set, and the 2012 PMG set. So, all kind of very iconic sets. I had thought, like, for sure, 
with with a bullet that blasts for the past was gonna i even said is this even worth a pull worth doing and in a shocking to me result right yeah it recency, did not win though you gotta remember recency mm. fresh fresh in the people's mind is 16 bit so 2008 jambalaya finished in last place with 16 percent 2012 pmg 25 percent Blast from the past from 1998 OPG 29% and the winner winner chicken dinner by by I think two or three votes so very very wow. close was 2021 allure 16 bit nice so if you didn't see the percentages you just saw the list and you had to pick the winner which would you have thought allure the I I would have won 16 bit personally just because it's more my style video games recent I I'm surprised what does surprise me is Jambalaya was the last place that surprised yeah, me. Yeah, no love for the Jambalaya. Jeez. Well, that makes the 16 bit Easter egg Troy from the 2021 22 Allure uh, release this week's Hobby Deep Dive. Now, the 16 bit Easter egg was pretty much an immediate hit, I would say, as it yes. first appeared Allure in 2021 22. Uh, these cards are only released in Allure, so that's important to know. It has, of course, the great nostalgic high into the 16-bit video game consoles that were first released in the fall of 1987 with the NEC Home Electronics PC Engine Troy, known as the Turbo Graphics 16. Did you have you one fun, of those? You want a fun fact? Yeah. The PC Engine was its name in Japan. Turbo Graphics 16 was its name in the states. Oh, really? So did you have one? I did not. I ha- I do have one right now. I have the mini version that they came out with. It's a lot of fun to play. It's cool. I did not, but I did not have one when it first came out. Is any C Nintendo though? Basically, no. That Nintendo Entertainment Corporation wasn't. No, Nintendo. Well, the NES Nintendo Entertainment System. Oh, Next, a whole different time. company. Got Don't it. get me going. We. I might just start a video game podcast right now. Like I'm ready. <laughs> well, while, well, Troy. While the Turbo Graphics 16 was the first. 16-bit video game console most people remember you know the other i guess way to reference 16-bit consoles is fourth generation as they were called the the most popular ones was really a battle battle between the sega genesis and of course the super nintendo yeah and just to let you know i i tried to catch myself before it came out of my mouth pc engine was what it was called everywhere else in the world except the u.s u.s was turbo graphic 16 i don't don't even remember that like Really, I remember didn't. coming out. It had the the car or the cartridges. They weren't. I mean, I don't know what you want to call them. They were. I don't know. They were about. They're smaller than this, but they were like this. They were flat. They had little the chip reader. And, really? Yeah. They were. They weren't like really. Car- they almost were like credit card sized, and you put them in. Well, I remember the Atari twenty six hundred, and then the Nintendo. Like that's <laughs> like the jump that existed in in my mind. Okay. So if you're watching on YouTube, right, uh, I kind of threw up a picture here just to get an idea of like what 16-bit video games look like. So here's Super Mario World. Yep. Uh, what was that like the home? What did they call that? The title screen or? Yeah, the home, home screen, screen. Title screen. Home screen for that. 49 million Super Nintendo consoles would end up selling worldwide, Try. It's pretty amazing. So, now you think that's a lot. Start looking up Game Boy, Nintendo Wii. Oh, I'm uh, sure numbers they get they get crazy how much those have sold. So in the in the reference to all this sort of you know from a nostalgic perspective, given that forty some year old people like this is when <laughs> yep. you know when we were kind of in our formative years, right? And we typically have the money to spend. Yeah, I was just say that's on, a on, genius on, thing. On disposable income now for all of us. Yeah, so it, from that perspective, it makes sense that these Easter eggs from 2020 Allure, 2021 Allure would have resonated so quickly with with people. Now, okay, so I think it's worth again covering the whole Easter egg concept. Yep. An Easter egg simply means that the set did not appear on the official checklist when 2021-22 Allure came out. What many people do, and I've been guilty of this in the past too, is you you also equate Easter egg as being like super short print. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, there's only five of these or ten of these, something like that. What we've learned, I think all of us, 
this year in the hobby with the Bedard NHL draft Easter egg SP is that it does not necessarily mean they're short printed Mm -hmm. just because it's an Easter egg. That being said, and we'll kind of get into the whys in a few minutes here, all indications and every data point for 2021 16 bit cars points to that they were very limited in production. Like they're just, they're just a really Mm -hmm. tough case. It'll always be a little bit of a mystery to Troy because these cars are not numbered. So it's not serial numbered. And one of the byproducts of being an Easter egg is you don't get pack odds or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So there's really no way to tell by other than by looking at secondary market sales data and anecdotally how often you see them in sort of the quote unquote wild to get some sort of indication of how many there are. When you look at the 2021-22 16-bit checklist, there were 23 cards on the set. Now, the other kind of unique thing about these Easter eggs like this is that that was not known right away. Mm-hmm. It took six months to, to like, if you went to go to card work. Yeah, to get them all filled in. To yeah. get them all filled in, right? It would be kind of patchwork and be like, well, these are the 10 we know about, and there's 13 others that we have no idea and we got to wait until they're pulled or they show up on eBay or somebody notifies us to really complete that checklist. I, I always think that's kind of cool. Like when you go and you check out a checklist and you see that there's some cards that haven't even been discovered at this point. Do you think for the upcoming Allure release that's not out yet, whatever the next one is, that Cardboard Connection would take them eight years to get this checklist updated now? Yeah. Shots fired. Well, well <laughs> The kind of scary part is Beckett doesn't have the checklist. I don't think they don't. Um, They're usually so good about having like additional pages of like images of uh, short prints and stuff. That's not for 2021. They don't have it. Maybe it's because it's pandemic times or something. I don't know. So if you're watching on YouTube, here's the things to know about the checklist for the 2021 16 bits. It's all veterans. There's no rookies. There's no legends. As I mentioned, there's 23 players on the checklist. We're not going to go through all of them, but the biggest names are Connor McDavid, Matthew Kachuk, Sidney Crosby, Pasta, Kale yeah. McCarr, Ovi, Jack Hughes, and Capriza. Right? I'd probably throw those ones in there. Like I said, a minute or two. I'm pretty confident not many of these were printed. When you look on Card Ladder and you search for 2021 Allure 16 bit, 119 sales total come up. That's and that's again for 23 cards. So if you average, it's about each card has sold on average about five times. Then sort of triangulating, triangulating some other points of research. Today, there's 21 for sale on eBay of the 20 total. And then if you look at the PSA pop report for 2021-22 Allure 16-bit, 71 total have been graded. The highest number graded for a single player is for McDavid. 13 Makes copies sense. have been graded by PSA. Boy, these things must, they got to be super short printed. Holy cow. I'm thinking like 20, 25, probably each, something, something like that. Of the 71 that have been graded, Troy, 43 have received the PSA 10 grades. That's about a 61% gem rate. And of the 23, I just what I wanted to do is list the top five highest selling, so which players sell for the most. And then I picked, we're going to go through from five to one. And then I just listed the highest sale for each player because I think like the first like the top three or four sales are the same guy. So it's a pretty boring kind oh, of gotcha. checklist. Gotcha. Gotcha. So number five is David Pasternak. His highest sale is 526. <laughs> it's raw. Via you, mean this, you mean this lion, this picture of the lion that they took? <laughs> yeah. I, well, love- I was going to mention this later too, but the one kind of nice thing about the whole 16 bit concept itself is it gives upper deck license to not yeah. be photorealistic yeah. to the, like, you know how so many people have complained about 
the the 2013 retro Marvel PMGs. Yes. And how they don't like the artistic the interpretation that they did, interpretations yeah. of the players where you know some of these get a little bonkers. Now the question I have for you cuz you would you're more the video game guy. Th- this does it's a 16 bit card but that is not a 16 bit image of pasta. That's like a Nintendo 64 type quality, like a 64. I, I was the first thing I thought is they look a little higher resolution than what 16 yeah. bit could do, but it, it, I get the gist. And but a I true 16 bit look, would look like just like basically. I mean, go back to this Mario picture. I mean, you can kind of would look like Minecraft version yeah, of every player. Yeah. So, so pasta is the number five highest selling player. Number four, Jack Hughes, his high this sale. Card, five. I, love it. I love this card, baby face and everything. But I like how they, I mean, they conveyed it. They conveyed he's a baby face little rookie in this one. 580 US dollars raw last October was the highest sale. Number three is Alexander Oviovechkin. <laughs> Look at that. Missing tooth and all. I love it. Yeah, that's pretty epic. I, I, I like this I like one. The looks, this one looks really good. Like this one looks great. So this one sold highest sale 608 raw. And that was from last March. Number two, now the, the number two and number one are graded. So there's Sid. Yep. He's number two. PSA 10. So for 1,205 US dollars uh, just this past November. And then number one, not a giant shock, is McDavid. Yep. PSA 10 sold for 1,405 US this past September as well. So there's your, I, I really like the designs. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think I like him even a little bit better than the 2022 version. But um, yeah, they're just pretty awesome. So once again, this set, 2021-22, was the first year for 16-bit. It only came in the Allure set. It did come back, in tw- I just mentioned, in the most recent Allure, 2022-23, it was not an Easter egg, though. Yep. They added it to the set, to the checklist as a set. And it's 20 cards in the most recent release. The pack odds are 1 in 8, 10. I'm guessing there's more mm-hmm. 16 bits in 2022 Allure. And so for, for a couple of reasons, I, I think that my collecting sensibility gravitates more to this initial release. The mm-hmm. one thing I really not not to make this about 2022 16 bit, but they replicated three players. It was uh, Ovechkin, McDavid, and Crosby. And why I think that that's important to know is that if, if any of those guys are your guys, long in the long haul, the 2021 is going to be, I think, a much better card than the 2022 because. I'm pretty big on the firsts when it comes to inserts. It's like Jambalaya, right? Do you want to get the, what's going to be better, the 2020 Kaprizov Jambalaya or the 2021, even though I don't think there was a 2020 Kaprizov. Yeah. But, yeah, well, it's so, a whole, re- whole repeating thing. My thing is, if they, I don't like that they did 16 bit again with repeater players. I don't like that, but I thought they might go the next level and go 32 bit or 64 bit or 8 bit. And then I would be fine if you came out with another McDavid or something. But I don't like that there's two 16-bit sets with the same guy. But, hey, that's what every set. You find you find one that hits. You know, there's yeah. multiple jambalayas and all, all those stuff. Well, like six years from now, they'd or eight years from now, they'd have to have like 8K OLED <laughs> or yeah, whatever the, OLED. Or... The whole bit thing is kind of going to lose its uh, muster now that we're getting into such crazy graphics. But all in all, it's been a huge hit. It's it's almost exactly what we've been asking for since the day we started this show for Upper Deck to try a whole bunch, bunch of concepts and mm-hmm. have that kind of big insert chase. And people love them. They're super tough to get. Yep. I'm pretty bullish over these on the over the long haul. And this is a card I think I might be hunting at the expo. Well, think too. This hit, like we were, t- you were talking about, people in their forties grew, or we grew up with this stuff. We grew up with this video game era of sixteen bit, and but also couple that with retro gaming, the retro gaming market. 
is mm-hmm. stupid right now. It is uh, it's done whatever. It's just shot straight up like a rocket. Prices are crazy, but again, now you're pulling in a whole bunch of new people into retro gaming and, you know, that maybe that ties into some of this too. It has that crossover, mm-hmm. right? Sensibility. So well, if you like these set deep dives, be sure to let us know. We can do more of them, and it's kind yep. of fun to mix and match with players so it doesn't feel like we're getting super repetitive. All right, got to make a quick mention for Gong Show Partner and Sponsor Slab Sharks. Of course, we are super grateful to them for their support of our show. The current Slab Sharks weekly eBay auction is live and ends tonight. Be sure to head to slabsharks.com to place your bids before it's too late. Always have the best of the best hockey cards available each week in their eBay auctions, Troy. But if you do miss the auction, it happens. No big deal. You can fall asleep like Troy does. Maybe you <laughs> caught her show a little bit later for the, you know, based on the reminder. No big deal. Once one auction ends, the next begins. And if you're Canadian, and I suppose if you're not sure, maybe, I don't know, check your birth certificate, or your passport or something. And if you do verify you're Canadian and you're looking to move some cards for cash, who isn't? We'd recommend considering Slap Sharks. For their eBay consignment services. They are very, very popular for a couple of fantastic reasons. First of all, Troy, they make it super easy to sell your cards on eBay because they do all the work. They take awesome photos, list your cards, answer buyer questions during the auction, hunt down payment from winners, ship to either Canada or the US, and handle any post sale issues. And then, secondly, and just as important, their weekly auction gets tons of eyeballs and are growing almost each week. We've heard from our Discord members that they've been very happy with the amount of views they get in their yep. auction items via Slab Sharks. So that's a good testimonial there in that case. And then remember, there's a 98% payout rates on all but our cards through June 1st. They also are going to have a new portal that Karn talked about a few weeks ago on our show right mm-hmm. around the time of the expo. So um, be ready and on the lookout for that. <laughs> and then for complete consignment information, to get started consigning your cards today, check out SlabSharks.com. Okay, so now I'm going to say this. I Now that we're talking about 16-bit, I'm in the video game mindset. And obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, you see I got the Slap Sharks page up. Shark was yep. going around in the background. If you get a chance and you're at a bar or a restaurant or a pinball arcade, check out the new Jaws pinball game. It is fantastic. So I'm mm-hmm. going to say just go. There's a little shark fin that pops up and moves around on the, on the play field. You got to hit it. And pinball games now are kind of nuts. They are. Yeah. We need to pick notch. one up for the Gong Show studio that we don't have. I I want the Foo Fighters one really bad. Ooh, I like Foo Fighters. Yeah, there's they're, they're coming. What, out is it, what does that go for though? Is this like ten? Uh, I no, it'd be like if you want like the I they, they come out in tiers. There's like the super high end, which will be limited to like a hundred or two fifty. Okay. Those will be like oh, it's like 15. a hockey card. They're like numbered out it of hundred. It is, and then they have like you keep the, it in a top loader. Yeah, you keep it in like a big sealed case. Then they have the middle tier, and I can't remember. I get the terminology wrong. Like the premium edition, which is the one I would probably get. Those, but they're really expensive. That's like nine, about ninety five hundred, ten grand oh. for the new releases. And then they have a lower model, which I want to say is around sixty nine hundred somewhere in their U.S. This is all U.S. money I'm talking yeah. about. But there are some, there's some pretty cool cool pinball games that are coming out recently. You know, I have a I have a good buddy that owns a big arcade yep. and got into collecting video games and that is like legit it's just as expensive as yes. sports cards. Yes. But it's logistically on a whole new level. Like yep. I can have 300 hockey cards in a small box. <laughs> My good buddy is 300 video games literally required a warehouse and that's why they opened their arcade because uh, check it out Starcade in St. Yep, Paul. Starcade. <laughs> Uh, because they just sit in a giant warehouse like yeah it's a very kind of i, I, I get yeah, i need to talk to him and ask him is there anywhere to get deals on news probably not i'm guessing there's not well he, I, might he said like they, they get them from japan like that's like the hookup oh ah, interesting yeah okay. cool hobby news hobby news let's do it i'm ready for i want my bedard number i need yes. it the road to infinity troy very very exciting last show we hit a major milestone on our road to infinity yep. Tracking the rise of the PSA 10 pop count for the base Connor Bedard Young Guns in just about a month, we've crossed over the 1,000 mark yep. for the pop count total and came in at last show at 1,045. Now, the question is, will it slow down or will the rise continue? As of three entire whole 
stinking days later, using data directly <laughs> from the PSA pop reports, the PSA 10 pop count for the Connor Bedard base young guns now sits Troy at 1,145. Yes, you've guessed it. It's an even Steven, 100 more in three days have been added to the pop count since our last show. A total now of 2,523 Bedard based young guns have been graded. Pretty sure that's more than 16 bits exist. Pretty sure. Jam rates at 45%. I think that's where it was last show, too. Yep, so yep, yep. that's stable. And it's safe to stay. We're still tracking for, I think, to hit 2,000 before the end of the month. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, if it's not, it could be, it'll be close. It'll be really the big close. jump is between the Thursday and Monday show. That's where okay. we, I think like the week before was like 89 mm-hmm. between Monday and Thursday. So we've upped that game a little bit at a hundred increase. There you are. There Road to infinity. All right. PSA 10 pop count. We're what? One month and four days after release <laughs> that we're recording. <laughs> Is 1,145. Pretty crazy. Well, a couple, I think, decent or significant hobby stories here, Troy. Mm -hmm. Uh, First of all, I'll do you the second one. A day or two ago, Darren Ravel's Coke. Okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. The name is so, I mean, I'd collect's fine, but you also have collectors and all that stuff. But come on. The it's CLL the worst brand ever. CT it's the worst brand. thing, whatever it is. And uh. and I want to say too, I'm not being a hater. Like I uh and you you'll find out I'm I'm happy about this. Oh yeah. I think it's a good thing. But I have worked in marketing and branding for 25 years, Troy. And it's never a good idea to have a brand mark or a logo that literally people can't say your name. Yeah. Cool. I have no idea how. <laughs> now we know it's collect. Yeah. But it's just like, and I'm sure that they paid someone like a stupid amount of money for this too, which is the funny part. It might be what the kids want here. I'm going to bring it up so we, I can show the site for everyone. So here it is. Here's the site. Yeah. You can okay. see the little logo does some fun stuff. Isn't that cool? So right. longtime sports media journalist and Darren Ravel started collect media. <laughs> uh, Ravel is touting it as the hobby's first real <laughs> shots real. fired. Shots fired, man. What? I I do take. I that is shots fired. I don't think that's true. No. Well, it, it is in some ways, and and I'll get into that in a second. So he got something like four million in funding, mm-hmm. and from like like. Had Leonet like what's the the Leonidas, cap, Leonidas or, yeah. or I think another sports team owner. So he's got some pretty solid backing for this. I, I did see an interview, I think, uh, somewhere with him where he mentioned that they opened up offices in Times Square, which is really interesting to me. Hook. because <laughs> that's what I want you to use your money on. Here's your startup money. Now go um, buy some office space. That's super. Cute. I actually spent time thinking through that because I was a really curious move to me. It's it seems like an old fuddy duddy sort of like Dom Draper, Madman media kind of thing yeah. to do. It's like, shame, be in Times Square, <laughs> shame. But if they are like really going after like is that where everything is? I mean, brand right? is Madison Avenue, right? Yeah. Is that if you're going to host agencies and brands, that that's a little bit of inside baseball in the ad game. But maybe from that, but again, it, it feels a little like traditional. And unnecessary, but <laughs> do, you want, do, you want, do we want them to cross the river and go to New Jersey? <laughs> if I money. would ponying up four million, I would not be supportive of that decision. I'll just say it that. Uh, oh, and two, you know, I, I don't know if we were prepared to do this, Troy, but as long as Darren Ravel announced that you know he got four million in funding <laughs> to create a media empire, we should probably make our announcement too. We we did have a round of, I think you'd call it like angel investing. Angel investing series, yep. series one. Really Something like three it. weeks ago now, three or four weeks ago for our show. It took a while, uh, some serious negotiations, like six months or something like that. Closed a big round of funding for the Gong Show that we're very, very excited <laughs> about. I don't even know about this. Yeah, I, I can't <laughs> reveal who, not even to you. 
they made it very <laughs> apparent that it can't. But we did have an investor that believes in us a lot, Troy. And again, I can't reveal a ton of details who it is, the exact amount. I'll just say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 bucks. $400 Monopoly money. Mm-hmm. Now, given this is a 50 50 venture, right? We're equal partners in this <laughs> nice. train wreck. Get- um, with a couple hundred bucks piece, Troy, we could split a series two hobby box with there our angel investment funding. Think about that. There we go. But I'm breaking. <laughs> Let's get back to. Uh, so here, here's why i like it right and, and why why i part of me can roll my eyes like the first real journalist darren revell does have the pedigree when he al- announced the network a couple days ago he was on like cnbc yeah and, and you know um we're not on cnbc uh, <laughs> we're not on any of those letters uh, not no. even one of them and that does i think give you a, a little bit of credibility and it does bring credibility to the space, right? you got this guy who's on CNBC talking about the collectible space to people that are interested in money and investing. And so I think it does bring a level of pedigree to the journalistic side of the hobby where, you know, to this point, it's more quote unquote influencers and YouTubers taking pot shots at people. And so uh, it is a good thing. And I would say too, even for our reference in doing this show and for the next story we'll get into, uh, the articles have been pretty good. So yeah. I'm, you know, I think Ravel is a little bit of a lightning rod. I think he can have an ego. Well, he, he's got journalistic time. chops and he's a, he's a, comes off in his egomaniac. <laughs> That's yeah. about it. I mean, he's, he's been around. He used to at ESPN and then maybe Bloomberg and, He's been mm-hmm. at some big places. I'm, I'm like you said, I'm glad someone else is getting in here. I will say, I think Rovell, when he first got in the sports or to the trading cards memorabilia space, he was pumping some products, which I think rubbed people the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And then, but at least I, th- I think a lot of people thought he was going to be like a, what's the word I'm looking for? A flash in the pan. Like it's hot. I'm going to, st- I'm going to be in it now and do reporting on it, but then I'm going to go away. This kind of shows he's actually sticking around. So, I mean, kudos for that, but we'll see how it goes. It's another sign of the maturation of the hobby to me. Yeah. Where people would say, well, the, the, the sports card hobby 15 years ago was nothing but a bunch of old sweaty guys in a 90 degree church basement <laughs> times yeah. a month doing card yeah. shows. Right. And now you have good decision or not. You have a legitimate ish, I guess, media company with Times Square offices that are solely dedicated to covering the collectibles market. So uh, yeah, that is a good sign for all of us, I think. All right, you got the next story, the biggest story. Big story, buried the lead, I guess. Um, Right here, this best picture I can find. (laughs) I'm just gonna throw Ken Golden up here. So eBay uh, announced this morning, Josh, as of the recording, Wednesday morning, eBay will be acquiring Golden Auctions. Oh, let that sink in if you didn't know. So that's what we got. eBay is going to acquire Golden. Golden mm-hmm. will continue to operate as a se- separate business with Ken Golden still in charge. That could change. And Josh, per collect or <laughs> 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 Golden, which is currently owned by Collectors, which is the owners of PSA. Selling, so they were kind of trying to get in this a little bit. They're saying selling golden allows collectors to focus on its core grading business and not worry about criticism that it grades cards and has a marketplace. Oh. Collectors, collectors recently acquired SGC, its grading competitor. So take that as part of the deal. Wait, wait can we stop there though? Is that yeah. like the real reason? Do you think? No, I, or is I, that who that? knows? I. <clears throat> we, we i i said this to you earlier i know it's a huge story but it's one story i just could care i just yeah i'm telling because people are interested in it but it doesn't fall into something i'm interested in with all the grading and stuff and i do use a vault pwcc vault but i the whole vault stuff we'll get into in a little bit part of this deal but yeah is that the real reason probably not the real reason it money. can't be right? because <laughs> because if golden were making 
so much money and has such high mm-hmm. growth potential. A couple people complaining about that issue, which which yeah. is, I mean, not that there isn't a legitimate complaint yeah, around legit. it, would not be compelling enough yeah. to get you to bail on this. So something's got to be behind this. Either it's a relationship issue yeah. or a profitability issue. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. companies have tons and tons of revenue but lose money. Yep. You have to, you know, you know, businesses need to be profitable, and it's really interesting that. Nat would bail on it. And then I think the other aspect of is does this what does this mean for like the eBay? Is it really sizing up to be eBay versus Fanatics now? Mm. In like the War of the Worlds sort of well, that's King what, Kong versus Godzilla? Yeah, that's where I do get a little worried. I'm not a big I mean, I get it, it's free market, do what you want, but consolidation sometimes seems like it get could get very consumer unfriendly really quick. But, uh, okay, so we have that, right? eBay is buying Golden, first step. As part of the deal, Collectors, which owns PSA, will acquire eBay's vaulting business. Collectors has controlled Golden's vault since early last year. PSA will also allow customers to immediately list cards that are graded onto eBay. So I'm going to break this down. There's like three separate chunks of this whole announcement or what's going on like basically three transactions and the first one, there's a trading card commercial agreement that aims to provide, they want the seamless buying, selling, grading storage experience. So eBay and PSA plan to introduce their whole customer centric product experience over the coming months. And that's what I just kind of talked about. Plus PSA is launching a new service for customers to list trading cards on eBay as soon as they are graded. I do like, that's pretty cool to me. If you're big into grading, and yep. you use eBay, that's awesome. Send your stuff to PSA, get it graded. Next step, they just list it. You don't have to do a thing besides. There's a lot of shipping. Website. Yeah. Well, and then think about like the the Bedsy release mm-hmm. or Series 2 where quickness to market is a real thing. So if you <laughs> send your cards into PSA to get them graded and then have to wait, wait for them to be shipped back yep. and then listed on eBay, if somehow... PSA could do that faster. Yep. Save you two or three days. That could make all the difference in the world. Yep. So that's the first piece. Second piece, eBay acquired collectors, or sorry, eBay acquired collectors auction house golden. Yep. So that's the second piece of it. And then the third piece is eBay is selling the eBay vault to collectors. So there you go. I know it's a lot of different companies. It's like a three way tra- trade in the NBA or something. Or- NHL, they don't do a lot of three-way trades. Where does is it does basketball do a lot? NHL yeah, basketball does a lot because basketball has to make the salaries work. Yeah, the work. a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, NHL do does do it. I've seen it, but yeah, you gotta always get that other party involved. I see I should say the NHL now I think about it, does look pretty they do a good chunk of those. But again, that's what's going on. So if you hear eBay acquires gold, then there you go. Well, you made a great point when we were chatting very briefly before the show on the vault thing that I want to bring up again. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was that? You said. Well, I just saying, like, I, what this did kind of open my eyes to is like, hey, guess what? Your vaulting service that you're using can be sold. And it was just ne- never something I thought about. I I just didn't. I mean, I should have or you sh- it should be obvious, right? It's just another arm of a company that it can be sold. But it was one of those things where it's like, oh, interesting. And I wonder how that will play into some people's thoughts of this. There's a lot of reasons why I feel dumb <laughs> all the time. I'm two years into wrapping my head around this whole vaulting thing. Yeah. And I still don't think I get it. Like why it's such a big deal. I understand the p- basic principles and how it works. And for super, like if you're like wheeler dealer, like I want to buy a card on the PWCC weekly and then sell it later. But is that like, that's not flipping cards on the same play. Usually flipping works best when you like buy under the radar on platform a and bring mm-hmm. it to platform B. And then I know that there's like, sometimes you don't have to pay sales tax. You don't have to wait on shipping. Yep. You don't, but yeah, if you store it there for a certain time, you'll ship it to you for a discount. Like so I, get all that. I just, I just know they're in Oregon, so they don't have sales tax on it. Hmm. And I use the PWCC vault, so I'm yeah. not. I'm, I'm like not knocking it. I just don't. 
I kind of feel like in like the sports card boom of the pandemic, it made the whole vaulting concept made more sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know like how big of a deal vaulting is going like in our whole circle of people that we know that collect the idea of vaulting does it, it never even comes up. Yeah. I did. I, and maybe it is way more popular than, or, or maybe it's more popular in like basketball and football. I don't know. The other thing that I want to mention really briefly on this is the whole, anytime there's a sale like this, they're going to say, eBay is going to say we've acquired golden auctions. We're going to run it as a separate business for now. I think I had that quote in there maybe somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> I didn't want to did. read it. <laughs> I just like, this is fluff. But honestly, if they don't combine them, it makes no sense to yeah. to make that purchase, yep. right? Because the whole idea where it makes sense from eBay's perspective is I think most people have had, at least in the past, the perception on eBay that it's an amazing platform to sell cards like 25000 or less. But if it's going to be more than that, yep. then away. you would go to like the PWCC premiere yep. or something like that. Where so this it may be that that's a uh, perception that's going to be really hard for them to overcome. So that's a, that's why I could see them acquiring like golden. But then you're gonna make it easy to go just like they're talking about with like the vault and PSA to say that they're going to be two separate entities. It's like well then why buy it in the first place? No. Yeah. All right, we'll see how it all shakes out. That's for sure. Well, Troy, we're just a couple weeks away from the 2024 Spring Toronto Spark Art Expo. I always get the wording like order of operation. I did in the, in the, in the I did in the uh, uh, the intro. I, Is it Spark Art to Expo it, Toronto Spring or Spring like Spark Art Expo Toronto or Spring Toronto Spark Art Expo? So yeah, whatever it is, we uh, compete, I think we've covered yeah. all our bases. Well, we're going, of course. It'll be our fourth trip already to the expo. It's kind of wild, huh? Think about pretty well. Two year. Yeah. It doesn't get any less exciting either. I'm like very, very amped to go. Oh. I might go out early. Just really? Like, no. Think about Breaking it. Breaking news? Breaking news. I might I'll I, I want to get to the hockey hall of fame. I'll be so I might I might go out a day early. Oh wow. Okay. Well, what's become a little bit of a tradition on our show and to get us caught up to speed with what's new and exciting happening at the spring Toronto Spark Card Expo. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to chat with Mikey Singer. His company really runs the show and uh, makes it all happen. And he does a great job managing the show and all the staff there. And so he came on the show and filled this all in. So we're going to roll that conversation now. We're excited to be joined once again by Mikey Singer. From What's the name of your production, your event company, event management? It's Mikey Singer. At MKEM. MM. M K E M M K E M. Okay. There we go. Well, you're the guy that really puts on the expo. So there's no better person to talk to <laughs> as, as we get close to well, we're, we're at a week and a half or two weeks away. Something like that from the yeah, spring we're, or card. Expo. We're a couple, couple weeks away. Um, today, today's what today's Tuesday. So, yeah. well, today's Thursday for, for when it's all air, but uh, Tuesday for us in, in the time, uh, in the time warp. And uh, two weeks today, we'll be moving materials onto the show floor. So in the timeline of you preparing for the show, I I know it takes months and months to Mm -hmm. put something like this on. But when you're at the two week away, Mark, is it does it get super real at this point? Do you start to get nervous? Like, like what are for, for having to actually go and through the work and have the responsibility of making the show happen? Uh, where's your kind of your head at two weeks away? Well, it's, it's now it's, uh, and, and I was just talking to you off air a little bit before, but it's, it's late nights, early mornings, right. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of, a lot of missed weekends and, and family, uh, leading into these shows. So, uh, the closer we get, the less, the less free time there is stress level really doesn't kick in until maybe the Wednesday before the show when you're really on there and dealing with every exhibitor and and the the email flood is coming and you're you're on site so you can't really deal with it um 
the good thing is it's not my show, so the nerves aren't as bad uh, yeah. as a hired hand or as the Igor to uh, to Steve's Doctor Frankenstein. Uh, you know, so so he he I'm sure has more butterflies leading in these next couple weeks. Is you know not just Toronto, but the very next week we have the Edmonton show for the the third time. So you're really planning and executing two shows at the same time then for as of right well, now I'm well sure. three because two weeks after edmonton is montreal oh my gosh yeah okay well we're here to talk about the toronto expo toronto. Which is, of course which is april 25th through the 28th coming up very soon i want to start more at the big picture and mm-hmm. because so much of our audience is in the u.s and outside of canada uh you know europe too i suppose and Help us understand, like, as a hockey card collector, why the Sport Card Expo is so special. It is the mecca uh, of hockey. Obviously, being the home of the Hockey Hall of Fame, um, being being the place that Upper Deck takes the largest presence in any show that they attend. Uh, mm-hmm. Their, their two-decker or double-decker booth at the show mm-hmm. is a sight to behold. Um, what they do there, how they engage, they really come out. And, and also, you know, we're the, you know, we we are the home of hockey and you can see it on the show floor and the pieces that are out there. There is things, you know, and, and, and it's any, you know, don't take my word for it. Ask anyone who attends the show. You'll find things in hockey that you'd never find anywhere else. Uh, cards, not just valuable, but rarity, um, game-worn, uh, iconic pieces. So it, it's really, it's a it's a celebration of hockey. Obviously, it being the second largest hobby show in the world, it's going to have a little bit of everything. But it really mm-hmm. has the best collection and selection of hockey out there. Yeah, so I think that's an important point. Aside from the national here in the U.S., the Sport Card Expo in Toronto is really the second biggest. And, and how is that calculated? Is that by square footage typically or by attendees or... Well, it'd be both. It'd be both. Okay. It'd be both. It'd be both by attendee and and square footage. So by the, the footprint and a number of a uh, number of tables and a uh, number of tushies through that door. And that's not an you know when we talk about twenty five thousand people through the door, that doesn't include any kid who's under twelve uh, yeah. who gets in free, right? So those those aren't counted uh, uh, in that total. Uh, it's massive. It, mm-hmm. It's massive, but it's fun. It's also a really fun show. Oh, it's a blast. Okay, so give us the stats for this April show upcoming in two weeks. Like, what's the tables, square footage, and kind of, you know, to give people an idea of the scope and scale of it. Yeah, so there's about 700 tables uh, in total that make up the show for 250 exhibitors and 170,000 square feet. It is the largest show that we've ever done. Um we are adding more space for the autograph area because last year we were jammed to the gills. Mm-hmm. Um, we have again, a great lineup uh, of autograph guests that we're really excited about uh, some really cool meet and greets. We've really done a lot to, to grow the stage. The, the stage was as busy as it's ever been. Uh, mm-hmm. The Q and a portion with the players, we are getting some really cool stuff and I don't know why the players, uh, are giving us such great, great material up there. But last year, or last show, Peter, I mean, it was last year, but in November, Peter Forsberg did an interview with Jeremy Lee and gave us some awesome, awesome uh, stuff. Everyone who goes out there, like, it's just a fun conversation. You hear about their collecting, you hear about their their story. So that's been really great. And really great co- hobby content creators are going to be there, such as mm-hmm. yourself and Troy. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't miss it so you mentioned it's kind of the hockey card mecca we call it hockey card heaven you know six of one (laughs) half a dozen of another and and i think too that that's a really important point to make from the american perspective and you know i've communicated this to you often is that it's a somewhat tough sledding here in the states as a hockey card collector you go to shows and there may be you know local show 150 tables something 100 tables something like that and two guys have hockey cards and it's basically a bunch of base young guns type stuff that's pretty vanilla from the hockey perspective and then you show up at the sport card expo and 
it's honestly overwhelming. So this will be our fourth show, our fourth in a row, really, since we started uh, our podcast. Can't miss it at this point. We go to Toronto for the fall show and, of course, the spring show. And the first day we were there, which was fall of what would have been 2022, I'm guessing, yep. at that point. And I don't I almost like blacked out because I was so overwhelmed just by all the variety <laughs> of cards there. Cause you go again as an American for not having a lot of options to hundreds of Gretzky rookies, probably there to, and every card, you know, from pre-war to ultra modern tons of vintage. I mean, that that's the thing that really stood out to me that first day is just to see some cards uh, or a number of many cards in person that I looked at my computer screen a lot but had never really been able to see in person to um feel and touch so it's just incredible do you have you ever tried to guess how many cards are at the show oh my god no um i can't even guess how many are in each booth right because there's the cards that you see and and, and this is this is something for for anyone who goes to a card show there's the cards you see in the the showcases and things like that that are in slabs and then there is the cards in boxes, in cases, in sealed wax. And then there are the cards in like the penny boxes or the, the 50 cent yeah. boxes or the there's so many singles on the show floor. I, I, I would dare to say there are over a billion cards on that show floor, right? Like it is such a huge amount. Uh, and some of the booths, you know, could easily have 100,000. How many mm -hmm. does Burbank say he has? millions right like tens of millions or something like that tens of it has to be tens of millions right so yeah. uh, and again like huge store everything like that um not gonna times it but yeah there's got to be hundreds of millions of cards on that show floor have there ever been studies done at a show like yours about just like the the volume of money that's transacted on a daily basis i guarantee no um even so so little attention like on, on on a level of that has been there's been some studies and stuff like that on on the market but very little right like only mm -hmm. only in the last five years has the the hobby gone so mainstream as to warrant something uh, of someone looking at the study but there's millions of dollars in in transactions going on and trades, right? Like, because there's also oh, yeah. a lot of trade value and, and exhibitors buying to each other and and card seeing, you know, more than just the money. Um, what's cool about these shows is uh, some card that hasn't seen the light of days in 50 years makes its way onto the show floor. You know, yeah. I, I so often hear stories from our, our vendors of uh, a connection they made at a show in someone's house they went to and a collection they bought. That hasn't, you know, this guy's 84, uh, looking to, or, or 70 something and looking to convert it into cash finally. Um, and these cards haven't been seen in, like I said, 30, 40 years and really well, and cool finds. That's pretty, I think, somewhat unique too to the hockey hobby where it's more collector driven. And so you have that mm -hmm. scenario. You look at like basketball or football cards, you'll see like a Tom Brady, Ricky Contenders Auto for sale oh, tw twice a month, right? Even though it's out of a hundred where some of these hockey yep. grails, they get locked in a collection. And like you said, for 30 years, it, they'll know. And these people don't even care to be on social media. They don't care to show the collection. They just want to enjoy yeah. their cards in private. And yeah. And then they come to light and you're like, Holy smokes. Like there's a crazy card that nobody's seen ever. That's exactly it. Right. There's so many cards and, and, <laughs> Wonder if someone's. I I don't think that'll be the case with the one of one Bedard. If someone pulls it, I think we'll we'll see that yeah. person going to collect that bounty real quick. But uh, yeah, you're right. Um, it is very much more uh, collector driven. I think that's why you saw uh, less of that massive spike uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic uh, and slow rise, like slow burn, slow rise. I think you know, uh, and slower to to decrease too. Right mm -hmm. um, on on the the most part, where you saw like meteoric rises in the hobby in basketball and, and baseball and football, uh, you also saw meteoric falls over the last year. So sure, right? So it, it's all relative in the end. But yeah, um, really cool stuff at the thing, and and the you know 
the cup and um the cup and, and exquisite and some of the, the the cards that are are really found here right like because the cup is such a cool product and there's just not a lot of it so um you're gonna find some really cool pieces i, I can't remember what who bought that awesome mcdavid was it jeff wilson who bought the mcdavid up here I don't know. I, I, I seem to remember something like that, but yeah, you're right. There's just kind of, there's always cards that are kind of shocking to see in person. And I, I know that uh, usually somebody's exhibiting the whole 2005 06, the cup RPA set, right? You know, not just yep. the Crosby, not just the Ovechkin, but the, the whole set. We should mention too, of course, that the Expos in Mississauga, Toronto, which is just on the outskirts of the city. Did I say it right? Yeah, you, you said oh, it good. perfectly. Perfect, right? And, and basically where the airport is, so it makes it really convenient. It, it's at the International Center. One of the things, too, that, you know, you, you talk about, it's just not poof overnight. Spark Card Expo has become the second largest show in the hobby. It's actually one of the, is it the longest running show in the hobby as well? Uh, I don't know if it's the longest running show. It's one of. It's one of the long, it's longest running show in, in Canada. Um, but what happened was the ownership switched to, to the current owner and he had a vision, uh, for how he wanted the show to go and has invested time, effort, and money, uh, into the show. You know, we, we bear, we have far none the best stage. I know it doesn't sound so, so crazy, but it has added a lot of show, a lot to the mm -hmm. show. Um, we put a lot of effort and thought and care into, um, the autograph area and making it as a, a great experience for our fans as humanly possible. So little things like that, investing in uh, more interactive elements, you know, keeping an eye on food, keeping an eye on everything that we can to make it a, as good for the, the hobbyist as possible. Um, you know, early entries, VIPs, things like that. He's always tried to give a better experience. Um, yep. And that has shown, uh, including bringing in better and bigger autograph guests. When he first took over, it was uh, an afterthought, right? So uh, yep. he made that a priority. And uh, and that can be seen by who we got. You know, T. Mussolini is going to be in there. Uh, and Jeremy Lee is going to be, you know, freaking out in his inner child, which will be great. All right, well, let's cover that real quick. because And it is not just hockey players, too, of course. Some yep. pretty big names from the collectibles world and uh, pop culture in there as well. And so you have... Of course, you know, William Shatner, you got Dennis the Worm, Dennis Rodman, uh, George St. Pierre. He's Canadian, right? Yes, he is. Uh, he is definitely Canadian. Uh, he's from Montreal, so he'll be a huge fan favorite. Some baseball guys. Of course, you got the Blue Jays there in town. And then we get to hockey. Uh, a lot of all-time legends, all-time greats. You got Steve Shutt, uh, Simon Gagne, the Sutter brothers. That's kind of that's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh is that the first time that they'll be at the is, is it is and i think it's one of the first times they'll be signing all to, and it is the first time they'll all be signing together as a group um it's funny like you i know they're not i know it's a bad comparison and they'd probably kill me if i said it but like it does remind you of the hansen brothers right like a little bit it's just amazing that this many guys from the same family played in the nhl it's Incredible. crazy well this is one grouping right this is one generation yeah. of them and there's a yeah. there's a it's insane. It's insanely, you know, so, so someone was built for hockey there. And then, of course, Timo Solani, you've got Al McKinnis, uh, Thomas, Thomas Gaberly, who's a local, you know, guy from the, the Maple Leafs, got Felix the Cat, uh, Stefan Riche, Oli the Goalie. Uh, that, that's a pretty awesome one. A Warren Moon, I'm in Minnesota, so a lot of big Vikings legacy there. Mm -hmm. uh, just tons and tons of guys that you can go to the sport card expo toronto.com website cujo uh, dennis hall bernie nichols uh, billy smith you know stanley cup winning goalie so pretty awesome lineup have you guys ever tried to get gretzky yeah and i think it's just it's timing money uh and making it work with something like that and gretzky might even have an exclusive like that might have to be something that goes with uh upper deck for upper example. deck Right, so there's certain guys who are exclusive. You know, I'm sure Steve would love to also bring in Michael Jordan. I'd be like, yeah, that sounds yeah. great. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you about Gretzky. Like, let's just, like, hypothetically, if that were to happen, that would be logistically chaos, right? I'm sure. I'm sure. 
you know, we'd be able to handle it. Like we we would yeah. manage it. We've done something. Lemieux has been to the show in the past as well. Really? Uh, yeah. So it, it would probably be you know something like that. He, he, we had Bobby Orr uh, mm-hmm. n- just before the pandemic. Uh, so we've had players of that stature. Uh, it would just add, right? It would just be a, a real exciting lead up to the show and, uh, and an exciting time on, on site. Um, but again, uh, a good team with a, with a good plan like you guys do for the show. Uh, same thing for us. We, we would be able to handle it. So if Wayne's agent is out there listening, I promise you he'd be he'd be well taken care of if he decides to come meet his band. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he would be. Now, we've been to three shows. This will be our fourth, so we don't mm-hmm. have tons and tons of history. But I'll never forget the line for Matt Sundin. Of course, being a Toronto legend, that was insanity. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, to think of that for Matt Sundin versus like what it would be like for Wayne Gretzky. Uh, and even like Mike Tyson last year or last fall was a super big draw. Like it was Mike Tyson. Both of those that you've mentioned, Tyson and, and Sandin, are, are about as big as I've seen lineups for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Berdur was was pretty big uh, as well. And that was the second time in, in a few years that we've had Sandin come in and just sh- shows you the popularity. I mean, the man is a hockey legend and god of in course. Toronto. Okay, so what else are you excited about or what else is new or different other than having a really nice autograph and guest lineup there is it like what are the new wrinkles for the spring show so so the biggest thing is we're gonna have um so csc is coming in um and they're doing inside hall three which we'll have a it owns its own separate entrance so we're adding some entrances to the show to make it easier for fans to get in uh, is going to be uh, an area that is very much for our tcg fans um okay. obviously that's a big part of the hobby so they're going mm-hmm. to have photo booths there they're gonna have cosplayers there they had giant evs last year you might have walked into one if you walked into hall four it was sort of in the middle of the way uh, yep. so we've had to, you know it was so popular we had to create its own space for it uh, there'll be an esports section inside there I, I alluded to it before and also this is all within hall three which is going to be a really exciting uh area for us is we've got great influencers coming in. Um, I know it's not part of the show, but if you're you're a fan of the content people like I am um, and like we're on right now, we've got uh, Jay from Mojo Sports is coming in. Ryan from Card Collector 2 is coming in. Uh, Chris from Baseball. Uh, it, it, sorry, Collector. Dealer, investor, and I probably butchered that. Uh, yeah. Troy from Troy Fifteen, uh, from Troy Collects, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm still looking to add add a couple more. I'm just got a couple of good conversations, and then um, you know, you guys are coming in. Josh and Troy are coming in. Jeremy Lee. So we've got some really good content pieces and Coach Go. I shouldn't should not not mention coach Co, who I was just it's a home game for coach Co, but, it but is, yeah it no, is. he's a big he's a big deal well what what is exciting to me about and again you follow people you like certain content it in, hopefully enhances your hobby experience but to thinking of it from like the just the hockey hobby lens to get a like a card collector to or some of these guys to commit to come up there it really helps to shine a spotlight that on hockey that normally doesn't get that shine from that from their audience right <laughs> and so i think that that's you know high tide raises all ships so uh it's a very good thing for us it's so funny you say that because jay from mojo sports was listen i was listening to his content uh earlier tonight and he did a live where he was looking at an austin matthews and a bedard and deciding like with his his live which he wanted more of <laughs> And, and it's a thing that would have never happened had he not attended the show two shows ago. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and, a... and he was blown away. Now he's having Tim Hortons and talking about future watch. And, you know, as you mm-hmm. said, it's, it, it raids, it raises it for everyone and is a great thing to see for the hockey portion of the hobby. Well, there's two kind of exciting external factors that should amp up a lot of intensity 
around the show. Number one, you have the NHL playoffs, which will be going mm-hmm. on during the show. So that's always exciting. And, and it is kind of nice too. Like even the fall show is like right near the start of the season. So you've got perfect timing in that regard too for a lot of hype around there. But then getting back to the spring, we also have Bedarda Palooza, which we're in the th- in the throes right now of the whole Bedard mania. And so one of the things that I've been curious to ask you is, did this whole Bedard phenomenon, to what degree did it enter in, even like strategically or from planning or just your guys' thought process in executing this show? Is it a factor at all or just knowing that there's going to be a lot of intensity around the excitement for his rookie card. Well, I think that it's hard for us to plan because we can't like, if we had it our way in November in series one, but don't you, right? Like if we planned it, that's how we would have rolled it out. But um, it's, it's big for us, right? Like it's big for the hobby overall. Um, yeah. It's great for one of our major partners in upper deck. It's great for our title sponsor, eBay. It's great for our sponsor, Slab Shark. So it affects us in in, in many ways. It it brings up the excitement. Uh, It means that I have family members and friends of family and friends of friends calling me with their kids, asking me where to get tins. Can I get deals on tins? And I'm like, bro, I'm paying the same prices that you are. You want want to go on the chase with me? I'm down. Let's. Let's go splits, but I'm not. I don't have any discounts, so um, it, it's definitely added to the to the excitement over the hobby overall, uh, but not something that we can plan for, mm-hmm. right? Well, and, and, you, and you've got the extra element of good fortune too. That as of right now, when we're talking, from what we know, the gold Opus One Hundred One is still sitting in a pack somewhere. So yeah. th- that adds that another little layer too, doesn't it? I'm going to have social media teams in there waiting for someone to pull it in that in that upper yeah. deck booth, right? Like, I can't wait. And that's great for upper deck. They'll be selling a lot, a lot. Family show, family of show. Hobby boxes. Yeah, family show, family show. But yeah, so I expect to see a ton and, and a lot of excitement, right? Mm-hmm. And if it gets you- pulled there, whew, we're going to have to get the secure. We'll have to get the off-duty cops uh Surround that gentleman or or, or lady and uh, get them right to the car or straight to the David Adams booth. Yeah. yeah. So David Adams is going to be there. Yeah, David Adams is there. They there. They've been there for every show. Um, nice. They're also there for Hit Parade as well. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I've Adams seen them product. there. So they're they're there. It's funny. I, I never when I first started working with the show, I never got the booths that were just like. And David Adams is a. a one particular example they're not there to sell they're strictly there to buy mm-hmm. right they're so they're there to buy product, product and exactly yeah. and, and mm-hmm. because like as you said um you know for them being in buffalo a, a big hockey market it's not like they have <laughs> they don't have a ton of options to go and get get hockey cards other than toronto so um they've been a a, a supporter and an exhibitor and, and mm-hmm. for new stuff, you know, like for eBay, I, I just made a mention, it's exciting for them because, you know, such great activity and, and great sellers for them are doing really well. Um, a lot of new sellers are going on there and, you know, they're breaking cards and they're selling their Bedards on, online. Uh, so yeah. it's an exciting prospect for them. Uh, we'll be doing some cool breaks. So eBay has its own stage as well, um, yeah. which Coach Co. will be doing some hosting on. Uh, we will have kids breaks that will be going on there, uh, as well as, uh, you know, basically, a, a breaking celebration in eBay celebration for, for, for attendees to get into a, a free break with lots of great product. Uh, I'd, I'd suspect that there'll be some series two broken on that stage as well. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> One of the ways I look at shows just from a like hobby barometer of, health and growth and maturity is it to me it is kind of a good indication and i want to start with the kind of the corporate side of it have you noticed maybe like a maturing of the hobby as an industry just by how companies like ebay or uh, upper deck or other co- are treating the show are investing their own money into their show experiences and and things of that nature oh my god yeah 
Uh, in the last five years, the endemic, um, the endemic sponsor investment into the hobby, not just at this show, but at, at all events and, and what they do and how they approach it uh, is completely different, right? E eBay has, has really made it a core focus of their, their business and, and their business model going forward and has really, has really invested in the show. Um, you know, I, I was, I've been with them selling them the sponsorship since day one. Uh, when they started with two boosts and, and now they're the title sponsor of, of three of our events uh, across uh, the country mm -hmm. and, and really invest heavily in creating a great experience for both the, the vendors who are, are their vendors as well and the attendees who are coming on who are also the customers, right? So they've done a lot for it. Uh, you see companies like, you know, we I, I made mention of Upper Deck and, and what they've done. You know, in the last two years, they've really invested heavily in that boost space, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's paid off when they do, they had a little stage before where they would do the raffles from now they've got their upper deck and it's and it's yep. probably 1500 people standing around uh, excitedly engaging with the brand. Uh, it's a beautiful experience for people to come around. It's a good opportunity for them to uh, you know really get boots on the ground and, and meet people directly who are there and consumers you know if if this hobby you know 50 percent of this hobby disappeared tomorrow there'd still be a huge demand for their product in toronto right so uh it's a good 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 chance for them to meet their core audience and and continue to grow there um and then to places like pwcc um psa we talked about this uh, before we came on air, the fact that PSA came in and uh, set up in November to have live grading uh, on site in Toronto was a, a massive investment, a huge undertaking. The fact that Beckett is going to be here for the third time in a row doing live grading, uh, it's great for me. I take my future watches over to, to, to Beckett, I hand it to them, and by the end of the show, I have my future watches slabbed up and know that I can't break them. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily That's for me awesome. to, yeah, I love that. Like that, that for me is awesome. Like that, that is a real treat, uh, having the ability to do that. I remember, you know, four years ago, five years ago, it was tough to get them to even come out. Uh, now they're, now they're here and, and putting big investments into the hobby. Um, and they're taking it more seriously and they're taking customers, customer experiences, uh, is, is far, is taken far more seriously. So we'll see, you know, as uh, as the market continues to mature, as people continue to get more into the hobby, um, I don't think you're seeing crazy investments. There was a there was a period during the pandemic there was crazy money coming into the hobby. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're seeing smarter money not necessarily coming into the hobby, right? So um, people are being smart with it. They're still investing in that customer experiences. Um, what's great is we've added to the show too. You know, we've got two after show events where we've got the, the CSC, uh, fan yep. appreciation night on the Friday and, uh, and the minting, uh, sport card expo trade night that happens on the Saturday. Um, they've got new sponsors and we're going to have some cool, cool mm -hmm. partners doing some stuff for both of those events. Um, you know, the trade night is up to a, a, a thousand people. Uh, wow. That has grown from a hundred, right? And now you've got brands coming in and really supporting it, and it makes it yep. it, it really is a, a fun time. And then we've got Jeremy's kickoff event, uh, which is the hobby can't night miss. at Jack Astor's. Can't I literally I can't miss, and it is busting at the seams. You go to that, right? No, I've never been. I only talk in. Oh, I, I, I was, I, was gonna say, I don't think I've seen you there, but I can't imagine no. you could be there. Like you've got. A few things going on at that time, I'm sure. It's well, it's, we make a deal. Steve ends up going. He he leaves me at the facility and he goes okay. over. And and you'll hear me. And if anyone listening, um, if you hear me make mention to Steve, Steve's the owner of the event and and really the man. Like I I, I get to do these interviews because he's a shyer gentleman and likes mm -hmm. uh, and he says to me, I like to hear myself talk. So he sends me on these interviews. But he really is the reason why the show is so successful and and why it is where it is today. Um, and he he'll be at that event. And this year, I promised Jeremy I'm going to try to sneak over. All right. Yeah, you have to do that. Okay. I've never talked to you about this, but one of the more mind blowing things that I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around happened in the fall at the last show, where 
I can't remember who it was. Uh, one of our buddies came up to me and said, oh, have you gone and said hi to Marcel Dion? And I'm like, uh, what? He's like, yeah, he's at a booth. He just he has a booth. He just sits there and sells stuff. I'm like, yeah, you're talking about like Marcel Dion, the sixth all time leading scorer in NHL history, gets a booth at every show and just sits there and is like the nicest, sweetest guy ever and just talks to people all day long. I'm like, there's no way. And so then I, of course, I make a beeline over to that area where I'm assuming he is because there's, there is, uh, you know, and I think this is awesome, right? There's people that have had the same spot for many, many years. And so you, mm-hmm. you get, there's a level of familiarity that you, as you go to more and more of the shows that you get with the floor plan and kind of where Upper Deck is and where Jeremy Lee is and apparently where Marcel Dion is. And sure <laughs> enough, I walk by and he's just sitting there uh, yakking it up with uh, a bunch of fans. And I, I it's like, it's unbelievable to me that 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 happens. And he and he puts in, you know, he gives away packs of cards and sometimes for kids and he'll he'll hot pack them with an auto card that he does and stuff like that. So, you know, stuff like that is great and an amazing part of the hobby. He's an awesome guy. Right. Like and I, I think he got into this uh, portion of the hobby because his daughter wanted him to be. I uh, wanted to get into sports cards. So that's how he started his shop. And, you know, for him, I mean, being being on site at his booth guarantees people are stopping by. Right. So, oh, of course, great for him. Uh, and I think he enjoys the fans. Right. The the truth is most people are, are very thankful and happy to meet him. Uh, I imagine most of the parents more so than the, the little littler yeah. kids. But um it's still great. Like, that's awesome. Uh, it's funny, you know, Bobby Hall, uh, my cousin who's 10 years older than me, used to come to this show uh, in the early 90s. And Bobby Hall used to just walk around and sign autos for people. Right. It's that's always crazy. been that, you know, fun kind of atmosphere. OK, I want to get back really quick to Hobby Health. So as you look at the demand and sales of just tables and the people that want to sponsor and exhibit. And then you start to look at ticket sales, which I'm sure are ramping up right around right now with what you have, the data that you have today, what does it tell you about the health of the hobby? So overall, the health of the hobby is really strong. Um, The interest in it on, on a, on a level from, you know, 12 years old up is very strong um obviously that doesn't that doesn't mean and i'm not talking about card like card prices slab prices sure. you know or comparing something to to 2022 but i'll tell you right now like even if the prices aren't as high as 2021 mid pandemic the hobby is bigger there's more kids involved there's more people going with their you know we we just uh, talked about it. There's more kids going with their parents to go look for a tin of of uh, of series two, uh, yep. or, or calling me to talk about cards, or talking about trading cards, or there's a new trade night coming on. Uh, you know, that's that's how I judge the the hobby and how healthy it is. Is like, how's that local trade night doing? Put on by 14 year old kids uh, for their local community, and oh my god, there's 300 people at it. Wow. That's right, great. like that, and that's a specific thing I'm talking about at this local bar that was done by my neighborhood kids, and I gave them a bunch of freebies to give away. I came at the end of the night with my daughter, and it was gem. And that tells me, and this was before the Bedard Mania hit. It just tells me that the hobby is it's very um it's doing very well right now. I, I can't control what the manufacturers do, but I hope, sure. you know, they're, they're looking at this and not thinking, how can we make the most money right now? Um, but how can we cultivate this and, and make sure that these new, new collectors are feeling good about what they're doing? And that's doing through, you know, good product, keeping prices reasonable and making sure um, they're taking care of people with, uh, you know, good quality control and, and making it, it fun and not just about the dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That they're your collector first. Right. And then yeah. it's, it's always fun to build value in your collection, but you know, the, the people I think of that are most successful actually <laughs> have both and that make the most money are the people that just love the cards and are passionate about and passionate about learning and identifying 
cards that they believe in, that that's where you really can kind of separate yourself as not only just a club a collector, but an investor sort of type person as well. Yeah. Like, you know, and I'll never say this to my wife, but I can never lose on the cards I collect because I love each and every single one. Yep. That's an awesome way right? to put it. Yeah. And, and, and some I got more at, at more and some like for me as a collector, the drop in prices for some of these cards has been like, yes, perfect. Excellent. Now it's affordable versus it not being affordable before. So uh, I'm definitely enjoying the hobby as I showed you a stack oh, yeah. of uh, autos that I got to go get uh, graded. So we do this every time we talk to you, but I think it's a question that bears repeating and it's a commercial that we need to play a lot. If somebody's coming from the U S or just, uh, I want to start with like just general show or tips, right? So if, if whether you're from Canada, the U S or Europe or wherever you're coming from, to have the best experience at the show, what are some of the kind of the key do's and don'ts from your perspective? I uh, do research, right? So know what you want to go, know what you want to go purchase, know the pricing that you you want for that specific card based on comps, uh, recent comps, using eBay, using Terapeak, uh, mm -hmm. which I learned from this show. And, uh, and and making sure that you know the value of what you A, A want to buy or B want to sell, right? Yeah. And understand when if you're, you know, and that's that those are two different things, right? So when you're going into buy, you want to know where you want to buy at and what you're willing to buy at. Uh, going into sell, you have to go in and understand that if you see something sell on eBay or another place for a certain size uh, price, that you're not factoring in their overhead and things like that. So often mm -hmm. dealers won't pay the actual comp price because they've got to have a margin in there. So coming yeah. with that mindset in is, is always good. Uh, cash is king, right? So if you want to go buying and get better deal on cards, you're going to do a lot better uh, having cash on you versus saying PayPal or e-transfer. And for our American audience, e-transfer isn't a thing, but that's like the equivalent of Venmo sure. or yeah, or cash app. So uh, again, say, same sort of thing, but cash is always still uh, still number one. And uh, for our American friends, U.S. dollars are great, right? No, no Canadian is going to be mad at you for saying, hey, can I pay in U.S. dollars? And finally, with that is know your exchange rate. Um, right. You know, so uh, for, for U.S. and it's funny, I was talking to Mojo uh, as he was shopping around the show. He's like, oh, the Canadian exchange rate. I'm like, just know that you're like every dollar you have is worth a buck forty hours. So you're doing well. Uh, yeah. So so some of those prices, right? Like as you convert back to US, it looks pretty good to you guys. Um, and then finally, wear comfortable shoes. You're talking about 170,000 square feet of concrete. Uh, you're going to be walking a lot. You're going to be on your feet, you know, bring bottles of uh, reusable water, get some water on there because Again, you're gonna you're gonna walk around. There's food in in the hall, but there's food also around. Plan to spend a long time, right? Like even if you're just going for one day, expect to be there for three to four hours if you want to see most of the stuff. And you're gonna yeah. want, to, right? You're you're gonna say, ah, oh, I just want to be there for a little bit, but then you're gonna get into looking at a couple of booths and you'll talk to a couple of people, and before you know it, you're two hours in and you, you haven't exited hall five yet. Uh, so again, like. You really want to save some time uh, and just plan and uh, yeah, and, and come with a good mindset, right? Like you're going to have a great time. And even if you don't buy anything, uh, it's still a ton of fun, right? You're going to see some stuff that you won't see anywhere else. It's like going to a museum uh, or being invited into someone's house who, who has a great collection. So I always, that's one of the things I really love to do is, is shop, uh, shop with my eyes and my heart. Not necessarily my wallet. Oh, 100 percent. I say this all the time. Yeah. Could go there, not buy a single card, and have the best time. You know, the only yeah. that you answered the question beautifully. If I could add anything, it's just be open, talk to people, talk to the vendors. Everybody's so nice. You learn a lot just by being there. It's a a great way. You know, and maybe it's a little unfair for me because I'm in a different situation than some other people that we do the show and people listen to us and want to talk to us but we've just met so many people there and and made so and had such great conversations 
about the the hobby you know it can get a little a little lonely you know you're <laughs> i'll admit i don't go you know go around to birthday parties and stuff like that and i don't get to geek out about hockey cards because you know more, more people are are you know, like oh you collect hockey cards like adults do that you know sort of kind of thing it's like yeah actually they're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases <laughs> right you can blow people's minds but here is where you can have those you know really like i said geek out and have those amazing conversations with people the, then the other thing that that i would add to it is especially on saturday it's parking get early because at yes. the international center where the show is and it's actually the, the place is ama- is massive like they'll have and it's kind of a bummer that this happens but they'll have like like I, I, in canada you call cabins cottages which is super weird by the way it, you know you'll have like the outdoor <laughs> yeah. life cottage show or something like that and, yes. and 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 so parking can get a little tough if you show up like let's say around noon on saturday right Yes, it can. It can. You know what? And listen, the the good thing is the Cottage Life show is not co-locating uh next door to us uh this year. So there's less there's there should be less trouble, but it is. Look, uh, on Saturday, it's just the volume of people. Yeah. Uh, come early or or don't try to park in the facility. You know, park a little bit before or go for a walk, save yourself some time. Um, but yeah, it it can get a, a little hectic. We are to be fair, we are trying to work on solutions to make that a, a better a better process and a better experience for our fans. Even well, that's that. a good problem, though. I mean, there's so much interest and so yeah. many people want to get in the show that it's hard to uh, to to find a space. Um, and then there's lots of hotels, and like I said, you know what's nice about being in Mississauga near at the International Center, so close to the airport, of course, and Toronto Airport being a huge one. <coughs> a million hotels and lodging opportunities by there if you're traveling mm-hmm. so that shouldn't be a problem and you don't necessarily even have to have a car you can get a place that's close enough and they have like uber and lyft right there don't they yeah 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 okay so so that that's come on we're the fourth largest market in north america of know. course we got we were a uh, uh, little uh <laughs> this is a little tidbit for your audience uh, Uber Eats launched in Toronto. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then I, I was going to ask you earlier too. A second. For my recollection, it's pretty good. But you mentioned about, especially on the research end, try to do your research before. But sometimes you just see a card and you need to comp it out or research it a little bit. For my recollection, there's generally pretty good wireless service from within inside the show. There is. There is. You're 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 not going to have any problems. Um, for our U.S. guests, as long as you're you're so it's more your carrier if it'll it'll come yeah. across the border. Um, but yeah, your your wireless service is perfect there. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'll be, so I'll, I'll be gonna... comping right beside you, right? I'll be center staging yeah. it, uh, looking on uh, recent cops trying to trying to get it done. What do you use uh, quickly? You know, for for like, what would you recommend? Uh, we I we use Card Ladder just because their search interface is so easy. But then anything eBay, as you know, we verify in therapy because there's so yeah. many. I'll give you a really good example of what just happened. So some lucky person was uh, well lucky enough to pull the Bedard Young Guns exclusives out of 100, of course, but number 98, right? So the jersey mm-hmm. number. They have it listed for a pretty healthy amount, 400 grand on on eBay. And the listing, I want to say like three, four days ago, went as sold. And, but then they relisted the card, right? So for whatever reason, somebody bought the card, but didn't pay for it, of course, and then it was relisted. If you go on to any reporting platform right now, it shows a Conor Bedard Young Guns exclusives out of 100 just sold for 400 grand sold and completed and and, and yeah, well yeah because they don't ebay has two different reporting systems based on sales they have ebay sales history which doesn't report sales because like in my mind right definitionally a sale only occurs when money exchanges for a yes. for a product or service right really ebay sales history is just completed listings Terapeak 
only shows completed listings that have been paid. You paid for. It's not foolproof because you could pay and then refund, and for a of certain course. time, it'll it'll still show up in Terrapeak. But there are and to to have any idea how big of a problem this is. Like we do record, you know, like on social uh, on Instagram, we do like a lot of record sales. I'll do like a player search, like oh, let's see. In the last six months, what are the top selling Leon Dreisaitl cards? I'll find and I'll go through and I'll start at the one that sold for the most. I'll be in the eighth card. And I still haven't found one that's paid for. And these are on everybody's sales. So the top eight sales for a player in the last six months, none of them are real. And the problem is when you're at a show or you're at your home or you're wherever at a card shop and you see a card and you go to and they have it listed not only are they listing it for the price that these completed listings that are showing up on all the sales report supposedly sold for but but you're thinking that that's the last value of that of that card and so you you have to use terapeak to for any and so where you have like 130 point or market movers from sport card investor or card ladder, which we love because eBay doesn't give API access to Terapeak. They only give it through their sales history. So that, that you can't blame those platforms because th- that's the data that they're getting from eBay. And so in order for it to change, eBay has to make the decision to not report those as sales. And so that's just an update on theirs. And and look, yeah. and, and that's, I think the, the point that we are is do your research beforehand. Yeah. Uh, hey, you, look what you did, Mikey. You sucked me into the res- The one thing I'm I didn't mean about. to. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. And again, I love e- eBay as a platform. It's still the best. Sure. And it's funny. Like it is, it is, um, you know, and I think back to the early 90s and what we all used to use as the Beckett magazine that was an out, uh, outdated the minute it got to you uh, to where we are today. So there are flaws, but it is still the best uh, the best indicator on where we should. It is. It, it is the best the indicator. Thing. You're right. And I'll just yeah. say one more thing. and I promise I'll stop because I could talk about this forever <laughs> is that and, and I don't I'm not a very vindictive person. I'm not mad at eBay, <laughs> but. You know, we talked about sort of the hobby maturing and yep. in and becoming, you know, you've got like the Darren Ravel media, right? And he's on CNBC talking about sports cards as an alternative asset class. And if we're gonna kind of level up one or two more steps, we gotta have data that's real. Yep. Right. Is that and so this level of imperfect data will only take us so far and and as a as a hobby and you know eBay is a huge part of that because they're the biggest marketplace we're going to all have to come together and really come up with a standardized way that we would that we report sales to um you know to to get people to invest serious money into it yeah and i think that's you know what transparency in any asset class in any market is always great um as they mature and as they grow you're hoping to see more of that right and and it's not just (laughs) that is that that is not just uh, sports cards right that is a lot of asset classes right that that need more transparency um you know the whether it's uh games or plenty that could use a lot more transparency uh in the collector's uh, art market and things like that but um, I do see it moving forward. And, and as you said, like it, it continues to mature and get better. Uh, it's de- yep. it's definitely light years ahead of where it was in 1993 when I started in on this. Office. I'm sure there, there's there's progress. OK, so the last thing I want to ask you, and you've been awesome, you've been very generous with your time once again, is where do you see all this going? Like, like what do you see as, you know, I'm going to ask you like that hokey interview question that nobody likes yeah. like where do you see the sport card expo five years from now five years from now i see the sport card expo in two hundred fifty thousand square feet taking up almost all of the the facility um and having wow. very specific areas so i i see you know where i see the growth is not just in sports cards 
but I see more collectible items mm -hmm. coming in. Uh, TCG and companies. TC and then I see more TCG coming in and having a bigger part of the show. So, you know, with Pokemon, Larkana, mm -hmm. uh, Magic, that in and of itself is such a, a large market. And as that continues to grow within the hobby space, um, that that will be a nice part. And I can see our autograph area continuing to grow to where it's out, out outgrown it living with other stuff and now has to live in its own space. You know, mm -hmm. as we continue to get bigger names, uh, as we continue to work with, you know, Hall of Fame inductees and things like that. Um, and then I expect more uh, partnerships with part uh, with athletes and um and and card uh companies so you know i can very well see fanatics being in here one day and having an experience with one of their premium athletes or upper deck bringing in uh you know a wayne gretzky for example for a wayne gretzky experience inside the upper deck booth so i think as um as the market matures and and people mature along with it i think experiences will be important inside this this hobby and creating moments uh, that for people to to tie to the brand, so I, I see that growing, and I can see the hobby. And look, I, that doesn't necessarily have to be one straight line, uh, but yeah. I do can see see foresee the the market continuing to grow. I, I agree with you, and I think that athletes are going to get integrated more and more. I think athletes understand kind of the 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 impact and importance of the hobby. You know, you talked about you mentioned like with. Peter Forsberg and sort of his kind of acknowledgements and the contributions that he made to the fall show. That's one area, not really so much hockey related, but where Michael Rubin has leveraged his mm -hmm. influence in integrating, you know, when you have Tom Brady at card shops opening boxes of cards. That's a pretty big deal for this, for the hobby as a whole to have some of these things happen. And then, and then I wonder too if if we you know maybe it's one of the same like you mentioned experiences if it's more and you would be the guy to answer this but if there's more and more like events and experiences and not not just tables of cards yeah I, I well it's already happening at the show right well it's the Q and A's that are happening on the stage or or some of the you know Reggie Jackson canceled last year but we had like fifteen people who are going to play catch with them. Um, yeah. So more moments and experiences like that are going to be more commonplace uh, and more of a demand for it. And then, you know, a, as you said, Michael Rubin getting Tom Brady out at that uh, at that top launch day. If you saw how many celebrities, uh, celebrity athletes were at different uh, different card shops yeah. across the U.S. It was massive. Uh, Coach Co. flew out. Uh, our friend yeah, Coach Co. Good for him. got to get involved with that. And um, and then for the athlete side, it's great for their brand. So two things: one, they're into it, right? Like they grew up yep. card collecting. This was around them. Um, we've seen guys like you know uh, LeBron has a couple of his own rookies, right? So they see the value in it. Yep. They like it. They they want to collect it too. And then the second part to that is it helps the the sport overall. So the the teams themselves want to see fans collecting, want to see fans engage with the hobby. Uh, because it's just one more aspect of them in their fandom, right? So yeah. for that's why I think um, you know when you you brought up Darren Ravel and and that collect media, and I, I don't know too much about it, but cursory, what I do know is that there's a bunch of uh, sport team owners who are investing in the brand, and again, you know, with the theory behind, you know, it's just an extra part of the fandom, and the the more fanatics you have out there. Uh, being fans of the players and the the athletes and the teams, uh, the better it is for the sports overall. Totally agree. Well, once again, Sport Card Expo, Spring Expo in Toronto, April 25th through 28th. Um, gets our seal of approval, of course. It's the really the highlights of the year from a collecting standpoint. We just love going. And uh, you and... Uh, obviously, Steve, the owner, has created a great experience. You and your company do a fantastic job facilitating and running the show and, and making everything happen. And so uh, just, uh, you know, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for taking the time to come on and, and talk about uh, the event in a couple of weeks. My pleasure, Josh. Always, uh, always awesome. And congratulations on the growth of this show. 
Uh, it's Thank been you. great over the last two years to see it. So congratulations to you and Troy. All right, man. We'll, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Sounds good. All right, we're back. Many thanks again to Mikey Singer for joining the show. I suppose you haven't even had a chance to. I, look haven't, at it yet, I haven't even listened to it. I, uh, so it'll I, was be gonna, I was going to say, did you ask him what else is going on during the same time? Because if you didn't, I have it right now. I pulled it up, Josh. Okay. Okay. Here's what's going on at the Misaga. Or no, the International Center in Misaga. So oh yeah, there's no it. there's no cottage show. We we talked no about no cottage that. show. There is a designer shoe sale. So Ooh. guys, if you need incentive, Manolo no, Balanic. No, this is a little, like... little little stereotype, I guess. Or maybe if your wife doesn't want you to come, your girlfriend doesn't want to come yeah. to the show. But hey, there's a shoe sale, so you can you can invite them to that while you go do the cards. Or maybe the wife wants to come to the cards. And how popular is that going to be? Shoes. Are we going to have no parking on Saturday because? Yeah, designer, designer shoes. Shoe shoppers. And then on the 28th, there's an Earth Summit, Josh. So oh, it looks like only really two big shows. And I think one time there was like three big shows, and that was but if it, worth well, I'm happy about the Earth Summit because if you care about the Earth, you're not going to drive and put carbon in the atmosphere. So <laughs> that'll save parking spots there for us. A tree killing. Oh, we are tree killers in the sport because we collect cardboard, which oh, is yeah. made out of paper, which comes from trees. There you go. We're very non-environmental. Anyways, no, I've not listened to the interview yet, but I'm sure Mikey, as always, gives us awesome information. But the weird thing is I've listened to it because I was there. The audience has listened to it because they're watching the show. And so in the weird space kind time continu- continuum we live in, you're the co-host of the show and you're the only person that does <laughs> no, I haven't heard it. Yeah, okay, well, you'll have to catch up. And uh, Very, very much looking towards the expo. It is an amazing experience. I... Could not recommend anything more in this entire as from a hobby participation mm-hmm. perspective than going to the Toronto Sport Card Expo. So literally can't wait to go. Agree. New product releases. Not a lot going on. So we're gonna do a couple of highlights. One thing I wanted to do though, Troy, as there's no new release this week, is to take a little bit of look back. You and I have been both very, very excited for a long time for the 2022-23 Parker's Champions. Mm-hmm release this year uh product came out on march 20th so it's been something like three weeks uh i've been pretty happy with it have you been has it lived up to your expectations i like it no i really like it i will say i like sp signature edition legends whatever a little bit better but i've only bought or i've only got one box of this so i want to get more boxes i'm curious what it goes for at the expo but i will be looking for some i'd be shocked if you didn't Pick some up at the expo. <laughs> Wheeling them out in a car in a wheelbarrow. So I was curious to see: is there any sort of chase on the secondary market? What what types of cards are people going after? Yeah, what are they paying for? Um, and again, I think one of the most underrated things, and maybe not talked about enough parts of this set, is this box of is $120 US. Yep. I have no idea what it is in Canada. Probably cheaper, I'm sure. The autos are all hard signed. And what you'll what you'll find too, like there's a couple of, when we're gonna go over the top five sales, there's a couple of patch autos and it's game used materials. So you have yeah. hard signed game used patch autos in a hundred twenty dollar box. And then compare what? that to game used, which is Hardly not any game used memorabilia and sticker autos. It, it almost is like nonsensical. It's like, why did Upper Deck do this? I'm happy that they did. Yep. But it's, you know, and maybe from like a long term perspective, that will be a differentiator for the set maybe five, 10 years from now. Yep. Uh, in Canada, Clouds and Char is when I use the same exact price. Okay. 160 well, what do you something mean? Canadian. Oh, it comes yeah, into equivalent. 120. Yeah, 120 USA or USA. All right. So he, Here's the top five sales so far. Number five is it was a tie, so we're gonna do six. The veteran kind of base Alexander Ovechkin auto. So for 203 US dollars on March 24th. What's interesting to me about this card is I'm pretty sure Ovi intentionally signed yep. it to the right like that because he thought, oh, why cover up the image of myself? Yep. And so my question to you, Troy, is 
is it better that he did that? And now you have this sort of weird uncentered auto, but it doesn't, but the auto is not hidden by, or, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't, the uh... I, I actually love it. And I'll tell you why I like it with Ovi because that is his signature. Yep. I would be a little more probably not for it if it was someone like Mario Lemieux, right? Who's got a long signature or yeah. someone like that. And they try to squeeze it in there, but this is Ovi's signature. So I am completely fine. Or I actually like it that he went to the right and kept his. Cause it doesn't, the word I was looking for is blend in. It doesn't blend into the image yeah. of him. So you can clearly see the auto. And I, I, kind of weird I can live with the, there. I can live with the space over here. Cause I see a truck. That's fun. I like the truck. <laughs> so truck Ovi auto. You have such a beautiful mind when it comes to you pull out the <laughs> most random. What was the last show? Was it the, the smiling guy that you're in the background? That, that, that was the same guy. Yeah. yeah. But did you say the price yet for this? Yeah. 203 yeah. US. Okay. I'll take it. <laughs> sure. Okay. It's tied with again at 203 US with the, Yurash Slavkovsky rookie auto again on card auto. So for 23 US on March 31st via eBay auction. Okay, this is a do you know the thing about his auto that I'm not gonna say because it's a family show, but once you notice it, you oh, can never, yeah, not, I do. I you do can never it. not yeah. notice again for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's like Fight Club, right? They pop that pic image mm-hmm. up for a second, all of a sudden there it is. Now he went a little bit offset to the left. Yeah, he's he, very but, interesting decision here. Do you think they tell them like, "Hey, if you can do it, separate it a little, or just try not to cover your your lower half"? Because you can tell there's a no. Is I don't know if that's his normal auto with that break. Your Raj Slavkowski, but there's a notice. There's only break. one part of the auto I can't stop staring at. So <laughs> I think it just looks like a mad looking or mad looking snake. That's what it is. The number four highest selling <laughs> just for <moving> champions. <laughs> card is the there are times i wish that we did a total <laughs> like you had to card people at the door nc17 version Down of the show after 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 dark, yeah and we people that i think have gotten to know us actually like off the air <laughs> like you not so much but i'm actually a, kind of a dirty person and it it, uh, it sometimes it takes every bit of my fiber to <laughs> realize that kids listen to this show and which we're very grateful and yeah. proud of that fact but there's the Conor McDavid ju- Jukebox Heroes on card auto, which is out of 25. So for 250 US on April 1st. Now, this is a card that I got to admit, I would prefer these cards not be autoed and just have like a crazy, mm. like out of five or out of uh, yeah. one. But I get, I guess I get it. Um, I'm a big fan of these in person, these Jukebox Heroes. I don't know. Do you like them? I do. I think I have one. Hold on. I can't remember if I pulled one or not. No, I did not. But I do like how they look. I think you might have shown me one or something. Mm-hmm. Number three, Troy, is Mario Lemieux. Short print auto. So for 270 or 269.50 US on April 6th, eBay best offer. This is a great looking card. in my Great opinion. looking card. For 270 bucks. It's like, man, people are getting deals. Yeah, plus on this with this one, even though he signs over him, the white socks help that. Like you can still see yeah. the auto. Mm-hmm. The number two, though, Troy, this is like when I was talking about how people are sleeping on this set. Yeah. The second highest sale is an Ovechkin. It's a veteran. It's a patch auto out of 25. So for 270 US dollars on March 29th by auction, it was an auction. <laughs> Sixty-seven dollars so more than his. It's a his game used three-color patch with an on-card auto of Ovechkin for two hundred seventy bucks. Now the auto's like a little streaky. Yeah, but I don't know. I think it's still a great deal. And then the number one sale is the Wayne Gretzky nineteen fifty-one retro mini gold rainbow out of fifty-one. So for just three thirty-two US on. Or try, I think that's a good deal too. Yeah. Have we seen a Gretzky auto anywhere Mm-mm. in the minis? There's only five. There's only five. Yeah. I haven't seen one, but yeah. So that's the top five sales for Parker's champion. So it doesn't look like it's as much as I like it. And I'm a fanboy. All my boyfriends are in it. 
it doesn't seem to be resonating like to a super, I guess, yeah, significant degree on the yeah, drop the drop the box prices so I can buy. Good one. for me, yeah. Buy some singles. <laughs> All right, a couple of really quick things before we move yeah. on to the PWCC preview. Uh, just a reminder: thank you to our good friend Neil, Irish Fires collector. Want us to remind everyone that 2024 National Hockey Card Day is this Saturday. So what you can do is go into your local card shop. If it's a certified diamond dealer, I think, and they'll give you a free pack of hockey cards or a free pack if you spend a certain amount on upper deck products. There are Betsy rookies. Yeah, I'm looking at the checklist. It. We should have done a deep dive on this. Okay. <laughs> we, on did. The, we did? Maybe you were in, were you in London? Oh, I was probably in London, I bet. I bet. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, we, we went through it. Um. But National Hockey Card Day, it's a big, big event in your family. Do you guys have like plans? Do you have everyone coming over? Is there like a National Hockey Day tree? A <laughs> turkey no. dinner? Like, what do you serve for this holiday? I don't we'll try. Know. We'll try to go. We'll try. I'll see if I can get my son to go. Or he'll, he'll get a free pack. Oh yeah, we gotta go for sure. Get a bedsy. Then lastly, got an email today from Upper Deck regarding an updated hockey release calendar, Troy. So a couple of changes here. Just roll through it quickly. The Connor Bedard box set was originally supposed to come out today and was moved to next Wednesday, April 17th. Also the same day, 2023, 24 black diamond comes out the following week, April 24th. We still have 2023 metal universe champions. That checklist is out. We may spend a tiny amount of time on it. It, Like we just go over the three hockey cards that are usually in it. A next show. (laughs) Unlicensed. Yeah. Yeah. Then though, there is a change with, 2022-23 2022-23 Ultimate Collection, which was originally scheduled to come out on April 24th as well. That's now been pushed to 5-1. And then there's a new entry. A week later, as of today, we'll have another Bedsy, Bedlam, Bedarda Palooza 2023-24 Trilogy will be coming out on May 8th. So there's cool. your updated release calendar. All right, Troy. PWCC is a Gong Show Partner sponsor. We're thankful to them for their support of our show. A reminder, the April premiere auction is live, runs through April 18th. There's four amazing McDavid RPA PSA 10s, a Matthews Cup RPA at a 99, and just a 1985 Mario Lemieux OPG rookie PSA 10. Not too bad for hockey cards in this month's premiere. Head to pwccmarketplace.com to place your bids. Also, don't sleep on the fixed price marketplace. Over 5,000 hockey cards available to buy or make offers on. And then, of course, the current PWCC Weekly auction is live as well. Plenty of sweet, vintage, and modern hockey cards to choose from. You are Troy. I'm Josh. We've picked out Mm -hmm. our favorite vintage and modern hockey cards to highlight. Like we always do, we're going to start with our favorite vintage. I had fun with this this week. I got to admit. So my my first pick, Troy, is a 1910 C56 Percy LeSueur PSA 1. Um. I'm loving these pre-war cards. I might. I know, these are awesome, them. aren't they? I love these. This just looks dapper. I love the sweaters. They look like suit jackets. They're just awesome. Oh yeah. I'm really digging. I can't decide what I like better: the 1910 C56 or the 1911 C55. Mm-hmm. But I really like these C56 cards where you get the full body shot, yeah. like in this case of the goalie. Percy LeSueur. Now, if you're looking at this card on YouTube, you might be thinking to yourself, how is this a PSA 1? The image is beautiful. The centering is as good as you're going to find for a night, for a card that's, what, 115 years yeah. old? It's almost inconceivable. Well, the issue is on the back where it's very, there's a lot of paper loss at the top of the card. So it's pretty obvious that somebody had these in a binder and probably glued them to an album. And then one of their distant relatives 80 years later said, oh, God, these are worth a lot of money and ripped them (laughs) out of the the album. And some of the paper remained, right? But that this is where if you don't care about that, the back of a card. Yeah, I appeal if that's your thing. Yes, get the front. I mean, there's some blue dots down here, but that's, man, this looks pretty good, especially with that PSA 1 grade. I would be all over this. And there's only a, a handful of players in the 1910 C56 set that have that full body shot. Uh, you mentioned the sweater too. And I wanted to 
I wrote a note on that as well to just highlight if a person's ever wondered that's listening or watching why they call hockey jerseys sweaters, mm-hmm. this is it, right? Because yeah. it's literally like a, it's like a hockey cardigan. It looks like like a thick, almost Norwegian like sweater that you think of today where it's Ottawa with the black, red, and white yeah. with the big O in the over the chest on the on the left side. Uh pretty awesome looking card. Again, it's full body shot, and which is amazing too because he's a goaltender, right? So you get to see kind of the what the goalie gear was like in 1910. And one of the first things that stood out to me is he doesn't have like the traditional like mitt on the glove that looks like a, yeah. like a catcher's mitt or something like that. It's just two like almost like regular big, thick, heavy leather gloves that do extend up the arm quite a bit. And apparently they're called gauntlet style gloves. And actually, Percy LeSueur is the dude who invented him. There you go. He was not only just a goalie in the early 1900s, but he was also a hockey innovator, like so many of the players were back in in the day. He would actually go on to develop a a more like what we glove style what, with the mitt or whatever um, later on. I, I think. Are you a fan of this card? You like it? Love this card. Yep, I love it. So Lesur played with the Ottawa Senators from 1906 through the 1913-14 season. He had a nickname, Troy, Peerless Percy. <laughs> nice. He was an aggressive goaltender. So at the time, and I'm sure you know this, goaltenders were not allowed to, they had to play stand-up. Yep. You weren't allowed to like go down on the ice to stop a puck or anything. And I guess like he was known for charging players yep. that were rushing the net and would basically just bowl them over. <laughs> right? so I guess it's one way... To, to knock people yep. off the puck. So in addition to a player, Troy, he would go on to be a referee, coach, GM, and team owner. We've we've looked at so many guys that have that same story, right? Where it's like yeah. literally every possible way you could participate in hockey, they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame as a player in 1961. So I, I think, like you said, if you want a early goalie who's a pioneer... The very first, this is 1910, is the first year of hockey cards. So it's obviously a rookie card. And you you don't mind the fact that there's a paper. You're not going to find a PSA 1 that has a better looking front of a card yep. than this. It's just yep. not going to happen. Last sale of the 1910 C56 Percy Le Sewer PSA 1, 576 US dollars in the PWCC weekly last June. That was also the all time high. You got a current bet? 290 US dollars. All right, you got the next one. All right, Josh. I'm going back to 51 Parkhurst. Another player I didn't know a lot about, so I had to look him up, and it's pretty cool. But I'm going to start with the card. Josh, unlike a PSA 1, this is a PSA 8. So this one. That's again, nutty to think about. Yeah. Old card, 51 Parky looks, man, this thing looks in fantastic shape just from eye tests on the front. There's some red dots at the top right, but Look at these corner corners and edges. Woo. Yeah. They look really, really, really good. Probably why it's a PSA. And absolutely fantastic picture on the card. Lots of color. Looks very vibrant. I love how this looks. Love this card. And being Bill Gatsby, who I knew nothing about. I always want to say the Great Gatsby, but it's yeah. Crazy. I was just going to ask you. Is his nickname the Great Gatsby? I saw it something have to about be. It would that. have to be. I don't know when was. Yeah, maybe. I didn't. I didn't look for his nickname. I'll was, look. I'll look and see when the book came out. G A D S B Y. It's Gadsby. Is that so? Instead of the T with Gatsby, it's Gadsby. All right. Defenseman from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Played 20 seasons in the NHL with the Blackhawks, Rangers, and Detroit. 130 goals, 438 assists, 568 points in 1,248 games. Hall of Famer, three-time NHL first All-Star team, four-time NHL second All-Star team. Eight-time All-Star Game selection, and Josh, when Gadsby retired after the 1965-66 season, he held the NHL's career scoring leader among defensemen wow. with 568 points. Hey, Troy. Pretty cool. I have yeah. breaking news. Breaking news. Very exciting. <laughs> F. Scott it? Fitzgerald in 1925 wrote The Great Gadsby. So. Okay. From Minnesota. He should have had. Oh, yeah. One of us, Troy. He should have had the nickname, the Great Gadsby. Okay. We're going to give it to him if he didn't. 
posthumously, right? That's how you'd say that, right? Yeah, I think he's, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's passed away. Okay. Now, check this out. We had the high stats, now the wild stat, or wild thing. In 1939, Gadsby was traveling with his mother Aww. on the passenger liner Athenia when it was hit Ooh. by a torpedo fired by a German U-boat and sank. He and his mother spent several hours in a lifeboat before being rescued. There you go. How would wow. you like that? <laughs> Interesting. What a, the fact that you sur- he survived that. I think I've heard of the Athenia. You know, now that I'm getting older, I like the History Channel. <laughs> oh, you're, you're getting in the military history? Yeah. 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 A sure sign you're old well, and your eyebrows are going to get bushy soon. If you're in London every, anytime soon, Imperial War Museum. And then the War Hill or the Churchill War Rooms. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Okay. PSA 8 pop of this card is 35 with only seven copies graded higher. Last sale I could find of a PSA 8 copy of this card was on February 18th, 2024 for 820 US dollars via eBay and verified in therapy. Current bid 320 US dollars. Steal. Now you're the goalie coach, but I'm on a goalie roll today for. Mm-hmm. Get the goalies. Did I snipe any of the one? You would I think you would have picked this one, wouldn't you? Maybe I might have picked this one, but I was glad I got to do the Gadsby one. This card looks great. I, I love this one. It's a 1953 Parkhurst Al Rollins PSA 3. I picked the card just because the pose is awesome. <laughs> That's sweet. Well, now what's that goalie position called? Is that the well it's tech he's almost in a VH. He's close. This is called <laughs> no goalie in today's game would do what he's doing here but if is it an against, avh and almost vh just like the almost, almost vh because v i mean he's not on the post but if his leg pad is straight up on the post and then his other one's kind of in the horizontal position that's the that's the vh and then you got the rvh which reverses it it's a horizontal card it's a great painting an image yep. he's in a completely unique goalie pose it just looks awesome. It is a PSA three, so there's going to be condition issues. Yeah. So let's just say that right out of the get go here. It's pretty off center to the right and also to yeah. the top. Given though that the the card is a horizontal design and there's aging on the paper, and it kind of blends into the background mm-hmm. as off centered as it is, it doesn't bug me as much as no. other card. Like if it had a very white border, I don't know if I could mentally get past that. But th- this one looks good to me. Each corner has issues, but, and this is something that Jeremy Lee first pointed out to me, and I totally agree with. And a vintage card that's lower grade, where there's going to be corner wear, if it's even, I tend not to have a big problem with it. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. Like, if if there's three sharp corners and, like, one is a big <laughs> chunk out of it, yeah, then it's like, yeah. mm, but these are very uniform and even and kind of, uh, you know, doesn't distract me from the card. So yeah, it, it's a interesting pose, nice action shot. It's a painting again, not a photo, as they were in 1953. I love the vintage Blackhawks uniforms. Like I think that's a big bonus on the card with the just got that old school vibe to it. Yeah, it's just one of the cooler vintage goalie cards I think I've seen. Troy, I'm a big fan of this card. Mm-hmm. Now, Looks who's cool. Al Rollins? I'm going to be honest. I had no idea mm-hmm. when I saw this card. So Rollins played in the NHL starting in the 1949-50 NHL season, played 10 years for the Maple Leafs, Blackhawks, and Rangers, won the Vesna Trophy in 1951 as part of the Stanley Cup champion Maple Leafs. I remember now. I t- Troy, this guy is going to blow your mind. Do you know who this guy is? I don't think so. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. Okay, this is where it gets, like, bonkers. So Al Rollins, Troy, won the Hart Trophy in 1954 as a member of the Blackhawks. So that's kind of unique, a goalie. Not too many goalies have won the Hart Trophy, right? It, it was for the 1953-54 season, the year the same year as this card, by the way. He started 66 games for the Blackhawks, Troy. Finished with a record of 12, 47, and 7. <laughs> With the that was good enough. One, he won the Hart Trophy. <laughs> good enough for the Hart Trophy. That's not a typo, right? And so I, I'm, I'm just like shocked. I'm like how? So I, I end up doing a bunch of research, and I, I think it can be best described 
from an excerpt of an article that I found talking about his 1953-54 Hart Trophy campaign. So here's here's from the article I found. I, I w- want to give it an attribution, but I, I can't remember. Sorry. The Blackhawks would finish with just 12 wins to go with their 51 losses. Al Rollins would be the man in the net for all those wins. He gave up 213 goals in 66 games, sporting a hot air balloon size 3.23 goals against average. This is the Hart Trophy winner. Yeah. And yet, the prevalent discussion amongst hockey writers and podcasters. Just kidding. There weren't any podcasters. (laughs) Of the day was... Think how bad they would have been without Rollins. Fair. And it was this thinking that would see Rollins. He of the league low, league low, 12 wins. And shooting and shooting gallery target for the entire NHL. Voted as the NHL Hart Trophy winner for MVP to close the 1953-54 season. Chicago sports writer George Vass wrote, that Rollins won, and this is a quote, apparently for extraordinary gallantry under fire. I know I shouldn't joke. It's, like, it's hockey. It's a game. It's not war, but that's pretty funny. There's no way this would ever happen. No, not league. today. No way in H-E double hockey sticks this would ever happen. Part of me Elvis Merlinkins would be the, yeah. uh, the Hart Trophy winner this year. Right? Part of me digs it, though, that they just they had the reasoning. They threw it out there. This, this could be the debate in today's game where you have a guy – Think about Ottinger when he was lights out in the playoffs, but then they lost, yeah. right? And, you know, you had some people rumbling. Maybe he should get the MVP for the playoffs. I mean, I I can't remember if they were out after the second round that year or the third. I can't remember. But this is where you'd see that debate today where there's some, but usually MVP in the playoffs, not the regular season. But in today's NHL, it's usually MVP in the playoff always goes to a winning team. So maybe there's or a winning team player usually. They gave him the MVP. Of the whole, of the whole league. And his team sucks so bad. That's awesome. Yeah. Is that why Bernard's going to get the rookie of the year? Oh, <laughs> shots fired. Sorry. Last thing on Rollins, Troy, <laughs> he's one of only three NHL players joining Tommy Anderson and Josie Theodore who have won the Hart Trophy and are not in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think the hockey hall of fame is calling Jose Theodore anytime soon. Jose, I call him Jose because I like it. Jose, last sale of the 1953 Jose Parker's Al Rollins PSA three. It was 48 <laughs> US dollars back in January. All right, also the all time high. Got a current bid? Six US dollars. Is this a rookie? Ooh. No, no, it's not. I okay. think a 51 Parky would probably because he played for Toronto. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. We'd have to look that up, but I would assume that that would be the case. All right, we're going to switch to modern. I had to pick this card because it's a a 2013 Panini Prime Mario Lemieux Prime Colors patch out of 27 PSA 7. So the first thing that crossed my mind was A, sick patch. B, there's no way it's game used. Because if this was game used, it would Mm -hmm. be bonkers. So I go and I look at the back of the card and holy shnikes it's a game use patch is this the back of the card mm-hmm. All right. yes it is panini doesn't use the same language as upper deck so you actually gotta like focus on reading yep game worn material yeah they use game worn material and rubber deck is game used so it's the top half of the penguin of the pittsburgh penguins patch right yeah and what a right ridiculous here. patch. Yeah, so I went and I found the jersey. It looks like it's on the shoulder. But you go back, though. Here's the thing, Troy. You go back, and there's like, there's not blue. There's white. Yeah, and that yellow looks, that's gold. And this looks very well, yellow. For the plot to thicken, and maybe a unsolved oh. hobby mystery here, Troy. Here you go. Here you go. Do you want me to bring it up? Yeah, I, I, I'm like, well... I found another one. Yeah. Was the game you... And so one of two things is happening here. Well, it has to be that they're using, they, they did the old like Guy Lafleur trick where you have the Canadians Jersey with the Quebec Nordiques patch. I'm guessing that although this is an all-star card, 
They used a patch from a regular jersey, but then why make it an all star card? It's weird. This why does it have to be? It makes no sense. This is an all star card. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm YouTube viewers, I'm flipping back and forth because it's even like this material looks different. It's this is nuts. I don't know. How Where do you, else are you going to find that yeah. stupid <laughs> nice of a Mario Lemieux patch card yeah. either? Correct. I'm so conflicted on this card. I don't. And it's obviously not just upper deck because this is Padini that is the guilty party in this case. It's got to be, I think it is from the shoulder patch. but So that would mean that they would have had that shoulder patch on their regular jerseys at that time as well. Hmm. And then like the back of the card, we're not going to like read it, but it talks about like how many points he had in the yeah. star game. And so again, it's just like, it's so weird that they made this an all-star card when it's it couldn't be literally from that jersey because we <laughs> found the exact jersey and there's yeah they they didn't have like a home and away jersey because it was one game yeah one game unless there was like a skills what did they have skills back then or I think so I think that's skills competition it's a mystery right so but like I said if you can get past that and you'll find out these aren't like stupid expensive that the I uh, I'll say it again you'll be hard pressed to find a better Mario and the Mew patch than this card ever in, in any set. So if it's worth checking out just from, from that perspective. Okay. So we got to do a little bit of like, a, we talk about the all the time and I wanted to find a little bit of a fun fact or something that I thought was interesting and I didn't even understand this about, and this is specifically about the 1992-93 season. Hey, look at the back of the card. Was this the 1992-93 All-Star game or was it No, later? this was the 1996 All-Star game because I just oh. looked up and they did have a skills competition. If you'd like to know, puck control, relay, fastest skater, accuracy shooting, hardest shot, goaltender competition. There you go. Okay, but regardless, this is another mind-bending, boggling blowing mm -hmm. fact so 1992-93 Lemieux unfortunately missed the first two months of the season because he was getting treatments due to Hodgkin's lymphoma so he missed two months uh, yeah. how many games is that like 15 games probably something like that 30 games or 20 games he still finished that season Troy with 160 <laughs> points he had 69 goals and 91 assists in only 60. He missed 22 games a year. Yeah. 160 points in 60 games. Coming back from cancer. How? <laughs> wow. There's been some just amazing players. So that's 2.67 points per game. That's just yeah, puts them way over 200 or a little bit over 200. Not, I think, a shock, but he'd go on to win the Hart, Hart Ross trophies and then the Ted Lindsay Award for that season. Yep. I don't think they had the Masterton trophy, but I'm sure he would have won that 100 times over, right, for that campaign. Last sale of a 2013 Panini Prime Marley Mew Prime Colors patch out of 27. Just last September, sold for just 415 US dollars. All time high, 660 for the other Penguins patch, the one with the black background, which I found in June. What's the current bid at, Trey? 165 US dollars. Okay, the next one you pick. Have have we done this card before? Maybe. I'm just gonna say I wasn't the the modern there was a there was a I couldn't find I was yeah. trying to find something unique. And of course I picked probably the most expensive card in the in the whole thing, at least at the time of doing the write-up. But well the, yes, the only we have reason done. why I asked is because I was gonna do it, and then I was like Oh, we've done. We're starting to repeat like that. Percy Lasseur, we've done before. Really? Like way back in the day, I did it. I remember I did it. So we've we've done. Oh, but the, the, <laughs> don't. I mean, eventually we're gonna hit that where it's like we're gonna start repeating a couple times and yeah, okay. Always, always good to revisit. Um, yeah, this no. So it's the 2005 Upper Deck, the Cup Noble Number, Sidney Crosby, and Alex Ovechkin, rookie card patch out of ten. PSA eight population one hundred one none graded higher, so I love. I mean, it's a cool card. <laughs> I'll say that it's a very cool card. 
It's rookie year of both Ovi and Crosby on one card, which I think is pretty cool. So if you're on YouTube, here's the front. You yep. flip it over. There's Ovi and his pack. We for sure back. did this because we talked about yeah. the weird eight on the back. Yep, the weird eight. And it's also weird that you have all the back of the card text on the Ovi side. It's kind of weird. Yeah, he's uh, completely disrespected. By... <laughs> completely disrespected. Yeah, So and but again, you have them both on a rookie card patch in 2005, the cup. I think that kind of overshadows it. And I think that's, or did cool. Mitch cover this card on maybe on our <laughs> everyone cup. go listen to every show up until this show and tell us which one it was. Listen so. to 17,000 hours of hockey <laughs> cards going show podcast. And please yeah. tell us where well, we covered. I'm sure because the other thing up. is, wasn't this the only time this card was ever made? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't okay. remember that. I'll shut up. I was just to say it's. I'm gonna say Mitch, if he's listening, he'll just he'll tell us what what I get wrong. I didn't go. I listen. I think I knew we did this card before, so I'm not. I don't. This is gonna be quick, like two three minutes. It's a horizontal card, Josh. Always usually not my favorite, but I will make an exception for this one because it's pretty cool. Now, and I will totally say this: if I own this card, if I want it, I'd crack it. I don't even want. I I hate that this card's in a PSA slab, just because one I don't care about the grade. And I think it distracts from it. I'd rather have it. I have, a, I have the, the, a very important question for you, though. Yes. If you own the card, what side are you showing? Is it boyfriend Sid or boyfriend? <laughs> I would probably be, well, my new fandom for Sid. So I got to show Sid. But then yeah. I get on my Instagram feed 8 billion times this little like rotating card holder. I'd have, probably have to buy that then. And just let it just rotate around. And so I could see Ovi's beautiful face as well. <laughs> In weird eight, yeah. In weird eight. So again, cards in great condition. It's a PSA eight. Corner issues, definitely. You can see them if you zoom in. Um, that one's whitish, but down here you can see there's the black is kind of rubbing off, mm -hmm. and that one's looks all right. There you can see some whitening here. I'll zoom in even more on the top right. You can see definitely a little chipping there, mm -hmm. but again, thick patch cards. They always. What's use the thick. serial number on this one? Uh, four eight five five eight eight four six. No, the the serial number in the card. Oh, sorry, two, two out of ten. Two out of ten. So again, really There's nice two players on it. Yep. That maybe maybe. This is the highest graded copy of this card at PSA, with only one other graded copy of this card, which is a PSA six. I did find another authentic or an authentic graded card sure. of this also. But this one's got the highest graded at PSA 8. Recent sale of this card was I, the only one I could find was the authenticated one. Was the most, it was the only sale I could find. Sold for $4,440 US on February 11th of this year via PWCC. I did find there's four copies of this card that have been graded at BGS as well. And a BGS 8.5 sold in 2021 for $6,100 US dollars. I didn't go as far as look at each serial number on every card and try to figure out which ones got cracked and <laughs> resubmitted or if they're all different serial numbers. But current bid on this card is one thousand five hundred twenty-five U.S. dollars. Is it game used? Uh, hold on. <sniffs> yes. Whoops. Oh wow. Game used patch. Nice. So that would be for both Crosby and Ovech. Yep. Well, Troy, last card we're going to talk about. Got to keep up with the Crosby love here. 2010 Ultimate Collection, Sidney Crosby Ultimate Signatures Auto. It's raw, but NBA authenticated. And I chose this one because, in my mind, it's just a really nice Crosby Auto card. Uh, it's good looking. Good looking man, I guess. <laughs> really nice auto. Yes. So I, I don't know if it's an important card. It's mid-career. It's not numbered or anything like that. Um, but like I said, it, the auto stands out really nice. The card has kind of got that ultimate minimalist design. It's almost got like a color match vibe to it. It's got gold foiling. Mm -hmm. It's got a little bit of the penguins kind of gold in the background. Uh, the You'll have to like go and check out the condition yourself. It is a raw card. One of the things that's nice that PWCC does with these raw cards, they do like the heat mapping thing where they try to mm -hmm. identify areas of the card where they think that there might be some issues. There's literally nothing on the heat maps 
for this card. And so I decided, well, well, if you're in the market, never had a Sid Auto, or you want to pick up one that might be a little bit on the, I can't imagine it's super expensive, that this might be a good one to pick up. Uh, you like the card or no? I like the card. I love love the auto. The auto is like 100% looks clean. He's got a nice auto. Yeah, I don't see. I mean, I haven't zoomed in, but it looks really, really nice. Okay, so for my little taste of Sid, a little oh. wrinkle, a little fun fact, right? I looked up some. Have you heard about like his pregame ritual that he's pretty? I'm known sure for? it's got to be crazy because just knowing his personality and how he yeah. is. Well, I found five fun facts about his pregame ritual. So, number one, Portroy, apparently he is very meticulous about stick preparation. He'll spend more time than most taping his stick before every game with a brain surgeon's attention to detail. Like, many, many minutes, I guess, doing very, very particular in how his stick is taped. That's number one. Number two is he has to be the last guy off the ice after warm-ups. And I kind of... I'm brain damaged, right? And so I, I'm sitting here writing this, and I... I'm thinking it's like, well, what if he's playing like the Capitals? And what if that was like Ovechkin's thing? I they're, they're dealt both with this. In... Oh, I was just, I'm sorry. I was interrupting. I dealt with this in high school. We had this issue. We had a player that had to be last off the ice. The other team had a player that had to be last <laughs> off the ice. Yes. It's during a tournament game, like a, a holiday tournament. So not they the like State legit tournament. refuse. They both just stared at each other. <laughs> and finally, the ice guy who one of the workers is screaming at our girl and I'm standing there just watching it, but I'm by the door and I'm in earshot. And I just, I just turned to him. And like, I just said, Hey, and I was, I was probably raised my voice a little I'm like, don't yell at her. Tell me, do you want me to get her off the ice? You don't need to yell at her. And of course the other head coach was walking by. And of course he says something to me. So then I just said something to him. And then we got a kind of little, a little argument for about 10 seconds. But then both players actually almost literally skated off at the same time. It was such a stupid thing, but it was kind of fun to watch. <laughs> that is so that is so wild because that is the exact scenario that I was picturing. <laughs> like a game being 45 minutes late because literally the two players. Do I hear another one? Leave the, yeah, I do want to hear another one. We had one. another one where after the national anthem, our team always likes to be the, the last one to bang all their sticks. Well, we came up against another team that also wanted to be the last one to bang their sticks so no one would do it first Wait, and they, that's where they hold the sticks in the air right yeah like national anthem will end and then one one team both teams whatever doesn't matter they bang their sticks down that's kind of a tradition yeah. and it was dead silence in that rink for two minutes it was the most <laughs> awkward thing i've ever seen in my life so who budged i think the other team did budge finally i don't game of chicken and it was just weird because everyone was just like, are we just going to, this is what's happening. We're going to watch this. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. So before strapping the pads on, he has a very choreographed stretching routine. Like does, and I think like the undertone of all this is like, it's very sequential. It's always the same. And it's mm. like, yeah, he eats pasta and chicken pregame before every meal. And then finally, he puts his gear on in a very specific sequence. You know what this kind of reminded me of? Did you ever see the movie American Psycho? Yes. Yes. Where he's like, very, like the bone business card. And yes. Was very particular about they just, the, the 10 font. minutes on the font. And yeah, so but, you just sit, sit there and analyze everything to the mind, most minute detail. So, chicken, the pasta and chicken, is that the same thing as chicken parmesan or chicken I don't, parm? I don't know. What was it? Ovi eats. What was Wade Boggs? Oh, he had fried chicken. It was fried chicken, Wade Boggs. That, Before every game? 162 times a year? Yeah, he did fried chicken. And I was trying to, I was going to make a joke because it's always in sunny, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. They they make the joke about rest in peace, Wade Boggs. And people always bring that up and people think, they're like, he's not dead. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm pretty sure he is. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Last sale of a 2010 Ultimate Collection, Sidney Crosby, Ultimate Signatures, Auto Raw, just 265 bucks. Why am I so down? Oh, that was in 2021. I was like, why am I missing these? All-time high sale, though. Uh, PSA 10 went for 525 <laughs> this past September. <laughs> Current bid is $96. That's oh. the one thing that and I'm not judging you because I do the same thing. 
but you have like no problem blowing like six hundred dollars <laughs> on wax. I know, and you can't ever get yourself to spend like two hundred dollars on a good card. Yeah, the, the only thing where I went nuts was that those pecorine patches, monumental patches. Those are, those are pretty all, awesome. When I bought all three of those, I was like, and that wasn't cheap, but it's nothing like it's nothing like eight thousand that I see some of these cards go for, but. Uh, hey, that's... remember when we pre-recorded our interviews? So we thought that the show would. <laughs> this part I was watching go. that. I was like, "Oh well." It's a three-hour episode. Oh my! God. More content. More content for the people. Feed the algorithm, Troy. <laughs> Feed the algorithm. Yeah, maybe we're not real journalists. <laughs> <laughs> but do you do three-hour <laughs> podcasts about absolutely nothing? <laughs> no. Yeah, Darren Ravel of. <laughs> If we ever get him on, we have to stick with the bit. Really. <laughs> Very excited today to welcome Darren Ravel from... <laughs> <laughs> As he immediately logs off. Yeah. Uh, All right, personal you, pickup. You, personal you, pick personal pickups, yeah, we got to go. You you did say I, I kind of had a personal pickup. I bought a dollar card, Troy. Yeah. Just a whole dollar. Big decision. I'm just going to keep showing old cards that I have sitting on my desk. <laughs> so I got. So I picked up a 2022-23 Parker's Champions. Lucas Reichel. Remember him when he was actually good <laughs> like a year ago? Remember Thank when you. Chicago got the number one draft pick and Lucas Reichel cards went crazy on comp seed? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got it for very, for two very important reasons. Number one, I love, or three, I love these 51 Parker's mm-hmm. minis. Because of that, I think I might get the set. I might. I, I've never collected a set, and I, I've had self talk, and I'm like, maybe, maybe I should try it once. And now I, this card set has a hundred cards in it, so it's like, do I really have the patience to do that? I don't know. But this was a dollar, and then I thought the silver lining was, well, if he ever like decides to get his career back on track, it's a rookie, and it might not be a bad purchase either. Yeah, awesome photo, hey? Eh? Awesome blurry. photo, blurry. But I just noticed too, and I didn't even think about this with the whole Parkers. They have the career stats with these rookies on the front, and it's like yeah. career goals zero, zero <laughs> assist one, one point. Well, the, well, that could be like 2023, 20, 24 stats too, because he has about zero goals. <laughs> yeah. All right. My... All right. If you like the show, please leave a rating review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, Want to support us? Want to chat with us on the Hockey Cards Gone Show Discord server? If three hours wasn't enough for you, <laughs> uh, God bless you. And uh, please consider a five dollar month donation. Join on a one ninety nine support level tier on Patreon. Link is in the show description within our Instagram TikTok profile. It's uh, there's a link on our website, hockeycardsgongshow dot com. It's become a patron, and then on the Patreon website directly, you can go to p a t r e o n dot com, spelled it right, and search for <laughs> Hockey Cards Gong Show. We're on. We're old guys on social media. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dogbox Ventures LLC. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday.